the NDC also launches this manifesto by end of day today. It's going to be a big conversation about fee manifestos in the coming weeks. But on behalf of the rest of the team, good morning. Welcome to the Key Point here on TV3. We're live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and on DSTV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okanse. Welcome to the Key Point, where we go on to the key issues of the week with our informed guests for and on behalf of you, the Ghanaian people. Now, the MPP, as you've seen, officially launched their manifesto for this year's general election last week. And a number of the issues that Dr. Bamiya has talked about and in what I just played to you. But there are major statements, policy statements that he made captured in this manifesto. Sustaining and expanding Ghana's rebounding economic growth good governance, the number of jobs that have been created, which have all been either contested or defended, depending on which side of the pendulum you belong. This morning, we would have a conversation on the NPP's manifesto, some key aspects of this manifesto, because as I indicated, we're going to have that big manifesto conversation. But then again, how much premium did you put on it and what you heard? We'll have a conversation this morning here on Key Point. Also, come this morning, the Ministry of Youth and Sports sought to clarify the payment made to the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation for its role as the official broadcaster of the 13th Africa Games held in Accra earlier in the year. Now, this comes in the wake of this controversy sparked by comments made by the sports minister Mustafa Yusuf during a public accounts committee hearing. On Monday, August 19, the sports minister stated that GBC indeed had received in excess of $3 million for its production and broadcasting services for this Africa Games. That assertion indeed or that statement was contested by the GBC Director General, and, and then we began to see the details or the devil in the detail, and also all the issues that came with it. Is there finality and clarity to this matter? After Professor Amin Al Hassan publicly refuted this claim by the Minister, and then the subsequent statements from both the GBC and the Sports Ministry would we'll have a conversation this morning here you know, on key point. The Member of Parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency, who is a member of the Public Accounts Committee, Samuel Nate George, who asked that question, is going to be joining us this morning here on Key Point. There's a number of things have happened at this Public Accounts Committee which is concerning, to say the least, as always. But then again, to what end? What happens after the public outcry and the uproar? We'll talk about it this morning on Key Point. Now, the NDC also laid down some six conditions that must be met before the party agrees to a peace pact ahead of the 2024 general elections. Now, the chair, Johnson and Shedun Ketia, detailed these conditions at a meeting with the National Peace Council earlier in the week. Now, there are fundamental questions that have been asked, whether to look at this as just a narrow NDC demand or to expand the tentacles of these concerns that they have put out for the greater good. We'll have a conversation this morning. That beyond the peace pact, what has to also be done to ensure that we indeed keep this peace that we have together, which is a non-negotiable commodity for our democracy especially because of what's happening across the sub-region. Beyond the peace pact, what next? What has to be done? We have a conversation this morning here on Key Point, as always, with my informed, passionate Ghanaians who are going to be joining us. My name is Alfred Akonse. Welcome. This is Key Point. <music> For peace has not been laid properly. The foundation to achieve peaceful election is based on 
transparency and guarantees that the election will be free and fair. There is rule of law and that those who misconduct themselves outside the law will be dealt with. Chairman, you do not think that it is the responsibility of a big opposition party like the NDC and you are not a novice in politics to ensure that you're committed to peace and this is one of the signs that this major posi opposition party is committed to peace. It is not about the commitment. If violence is brewing and you go to just say that, oh, I'm signing a piece of paper that will guarantee peace, you will never get peace. The conditions for peaceful elections are there. These conditions are being breached, and we are laying foundation for violent confrontation in the elections. Let us work to remove the things that will generate violence. Critics? Once we, gen we remove them, then we don't even need to sign a document. But that involves so all the political that, parties, no, including it yourself. it involves government. Mm -hmm. Peace Council is saying it has been engaging political parties, including yourselves. It's there are discussions you've done, us. but you're we not communicating that. to we your people. That we are saying that go and talk to the law enforcement agencies. Let our people hear that the people who were killed in Techiman, the people who were killed in Accra, the people who were maimed in Ayawasu West Wogon, they are here. They are being prosecuted for wrongdoing. So it becomes a justice that if you approach in the election and you engage in violent conduct, there are consequences for you. Critics think if that does not happen, and you say that your focus is just to engage we, the leadership, I'm, 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 uh, it will undermine our leadership as well, because if I deploy people to go and work peacefully at the uh, polling station to ensure peaceful election, and some of them get killed, some of them got maimed, I maintain that they are cool, advise them that there will be consequences so, next, so that next time when you are going, nobody will have the audacity to do that. And you well, welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. We are live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, and uh, DSV channel 279. We're all across the world on 3news.com. The man you just heard is the national chairman of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, also reacting to the feedback or the reactions that have greeted the position that the party has taken, detailing some six conditions that they want to be, to be met or seen done before a decision is explicitly taken to sign this peace pact. There are divergent views on that position, but then again, the NDC is well convinced within their minds that th this has to be done, indeed for the greater good, not, to, not to just for the party alone. That's their position on this matter. We'll detail those six conditions that they have put out as we go on here on Key Point. Remember, we are very, very interactive, so you can join us with your thoughts, views, and, and also opinions as we read out to you and to the rest of the world. Joining me in the studio to have this conversation, and we'll have a few other persons joining us as we go on. Your most Samonate George is Member of Parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram Constituency. He's a member of the Public Accounts Committee and also a member of the NDC. He's going to be joining us in a bit. Yonobo Yabuabi Samoa is former member of parliament for the Adenta constituency, also a former director of communications of the MPP, but now he is a senior advisor to the leader of the movement for change, Alan Kojo Chermanting. And he's also a private legal practitioner as well. Yabuabi Samoa, good morning, welcome. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for having me. As always, it's good to have you join us. Please. Also joining us is on, on, on Zoom, Martin Pebble. He's a private legal practitioner. He is also a leader of one of three individual bond order groups and the convener of the Kumin Perkurilo Day demonstration. He'll be joining us in a bit. We also have Dr. Prince Hamidu Ama. He is a member of parliament for the Kwesimintim constituency, 
also a deputy minister for works and housing. It's a member of the MPP, Dr. Prince Hamidu Ama. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be on your program. And we also will be joined shortly by George Amo. George Amo is the executive secretary of the National Peace Council. They are the ones who always lead this. process of getting the political parties to sign the peace pact um, as, as one of the symbolic ways of getting them to commit to peace. So he'll be joining us in a bit. But let me also first run through the six conditions that the N NDC uh, have put out. And that's what you see on the screen. For the benefit of those who are listening to us on 3FM 92.7, first, full implementation of the IR. Also, West Warden Commission report. The recommendations in that report, the NDC wants the full implementation of the Ayawaso West Wagon Commission report. Also, they want the prosecution of all persons responsible for the 2020 election violence. And we're talking about this election violence that saw the death of eight people unprecedented never happened in our election or history in this country eight people dead also and, and as we speak nobody has been arrested as yet also investigations into the missing electoral equipment and just on, on an update of that yesterday a 52 year old man was arrested somewhere in Enswam with one of the BVDs, which is suspected to be belonging to the Electoral Commission. Investigations are underway. But the NDC is asking for investigations into the missing electoral equipment. Uh, also, the president should commit to respecting the outcome of the elections. And IGP, Chief Justice, Attorney General, National Security Coordinator, must sign the peace pact as well. These are the conditions that the NDC is making or putting forward before they sign it. Now, but Dr. Dr. Prince Amai, you know, we, we, this is the first time you're coming on the show, is it not? Yes, this is my first time of being on the show. Oh, I see. But, <laughs> known each other for quite a while, I see. Yeah. Before he went into politics, by the way. You mean Prince Ama? Prince Ama, yes. He's a brilliant technocrat. I doubt his politics. <laughs> <laughs> I see how you are starting He's your a program. brilliant technocrat. <laughs> he's a brilliant man. But you doubt his politics. Um, I doubt whether his, his, his capacity and knowledge ought to be expended in politics. <laughs> Why is that? I mean, uh, I, I, I knew him when he was in civil society. I'm not sure if Talking politics about is education. Uh, a but now you are of some a deputy people. <laughs> minister of works and housing. In fact, he was in the education ministry before. He deserves housing. congratulations. I think yes. he's, uh -huh. he's one of the young ones uh, who are trying to blaze a path, set an example uh, for recognition. What yes. you do, being uh, recognized by mm. your leadership and your peers. Okay. Like I said. Uh, uh, for me, my worry, my worry, really, if you are blazing a path, is that at some point then your principles, integrity and, and fidelity to what you believe in may sure. clash with, with the path you have I chosen. See. And uh, I'm not surprised, <laughs> and I will not be surprised if internally uh, my technically proficient brother is <laughs> offering internal. In fact, in fact, in fact, he was one of the. He was one of the. He was one of the few uh, members of the party that I looked up to. I I I, I feel very disappointed. I see him in this yellow. Honestly speaking, I, I told why, him why, why are you disappointed? I, I look up I, to him. Went for changes. You know, I'm saying that I, he's one of the few party members that I really looked up to. I engaged him 
uh, many years, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far back as 2006, 2007, yes. when he was leading uh, His Excellency Ali Muhammad's campaign, That's and I was true. also doing something else, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, he's somebody that I really, really respect, and uh, I feel very disappointed that he's moved into yes. the yellow, yellow. Exactly. I'm, because I'm hoping where, that I'm hoping that internal resolution has I, I'm me. hoping that he, he will come back. That's all that <laughs> I'm praying for. Question. I just hope that one day God will answer my prayers and see my my, my, my senior brother. You are, you are back praying to our party. for yes, your brother to, our, to yes, join yes, the MPP. Exactly, and come back to where he truly belongs to. You know, come yeah. back home. I see. Will, will, will those prayers be heard? It's an empty shell. That's what I'm saying. He he is coming to the point where he has reconciled his inner conflict. I see. The MPP is now an empty shell. It doesn't exist as MPP anymore. Nah, <laughs> it's been led by the CPP. It's now being flag buried by the NDC, NDC, the NDC and the PNC. And so really, might, where is, is the MPP? Possible? There is no fidelity to Dr. political Bamiya is structures a anymore. MPP. Now it's about individuals who have capacity to I lead. See. Because across all the parties, you find a mix of different political personalities who have been in different political organizations, right. entities, parties, who have now come together across board. Okay. So in reality, you now need to look at the quality of the individual, Very well. the leader. Well, okay. and, and you think that His Excellency, the Vice President, doesn't have I think that Alan J. Martin is the man. Well, I have, okay. have, okay. have, 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 have worked with uh, um, Mr. Alaji Martin before, and I compare him with Dr. Ali, uh, Alaji Mahmoud Baumia, and I think that um, Dr. Baumia stands tall. In your view, Dr. So Baumia, okay, ob obviously, obviously, and, and uh, that's our, and that's our like, job is to anyway, persuade. Yeah. So, yeah, since so 28 minutes <laughs> to the top of the hour. So, well, Do Dr. Prince Amma, first welcome, first time on, on this platform. But then again, it's also a good welcome to you as well. It's been a while. We saw the MPP on this platform, so I don't know, to say w welcome back is um, also in, in, in good stead, I would say. And let's take a look at the six conditions again, and then we would have some George joining us. But let me welcome um, Mr. George Amo is joining us on the telephone. Couldn't join us on Zoom because of a quick con um, connection problem. Um, he's Executive Secretary of the National Peace Council. Mr. Amo, good morning. Thank you for joining us here on Key Point. Good morning and greetings to um, the panel members there and uh, all those who are listening to us. This, this week, because this is not the first time this, this matter, in the, at least for the past three weeks or so, we've been having conversations about this peace pact. This week, you, uh, there's a committee from you that met the NDC leadership. Some conditions were, were put forward, um, which we have just run through. Now, first of all, what is the Peace Council's position on these conditions that the NDC is asking be met before they would sign on to this peace pact? Yeah, thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, let, me, let me situate the whole um, uh, I mean conversation uh, well. You know, the Peace Council as a mandate to facilitate and develop mechanisms. Mechanisms according to Act 1818 to prevent, manage, and to resolve conflicts. So um, we, we, we use mechanisms, or let me say we facilitate mechanisms uh, and, uh, as part of uh, achieving that mandate, particularly ahead of this election. The Peace Council uh, board decided to either partner or set up uh, committees. You know, that would help advance uh, this mandate. So one of the, of the committees is what uh, we have called the committee to monitor the code of conduct for political parties. Uh, the code was developed together with the roadmap on vigilantism. Uh, you remember somewhere in 2019, uh, the Peace Council and the two main political parties, the NDC and the NPP, uh, had to 
uh, dialogue on the, the way uh, to deal with the vigilante malaise. So uh, the committee that went to meet with the NDC was a committee uh, that the Peace Council has set up to monitor compliance of the court. So that is how we, 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 we are proceeding. Indeed, on Tuesday, the committee is meeting with the NPP. You see, so the committee went there uh, just to introduce themselves and to, to, to inform the party that the Peace Council has this committee in place. Should you have any complaints regarding electoral violence, the committee is there to assist. So that, 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 that I, ha I think I have to say. Uh, but coming to the, the position of the Peace Council on, on the conditions, that I think they are fair. If you are, you are a mediator, you are a peace institution, you would, you would have to uh, confront with positions of conflicting parties or parties who are agreed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is what the ABC did. And we, we think it, they are fair, the conditions are fair to us. Uh, we just have to look at it in terms of our mandate and see which ones we can do by ourselves and which ones we will need to refer or to partner with some other institutions to do. So I think that uh, that has been the position that we proceed from as a teaching institution. I see. So you, you make the, the last point you make is that these conditions are fair, but then you're going to yes. have to look, you, you're going to look at the conditions within the context of your mandate and what you can do. Yes. I see. But then again, there was a proposal to the party to let bygones be bygones, so we move on. I mean, has that attitude helped over the period where incidents happen and, you know, this position that we take that, well, let's just move on, we sweep things under the carpet, let bygones be bygones, and, the, and those incidents keep getting worse in subsequent years because we fail to deal with those issues decisively. What informed... No, no, what, no, no, I think... Uh, hello? Yes, Ms. Amo? You see, uh, yes, uh, my brother. Uh, you know, the, 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 those comments were made in, in a contest. Okay. If, if, you see, uh, when we met with the NDC, the chairman uh, made some, I mean, made some, did say some things. You know, regarding, as it has been in the news for some time, uh, we are silent, we are this and those things. So, in response, the, 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 the chairman from our side, uh, Malvi, uh, who chaired the committee, you know, uh, was, was trying to push for us to start from a clean sheet. Then let us forget now uh, that some things in the past that probably we should have commented, we didn't comment, or some expectations were there, but we didn't meet them. So let us forget about the past. Then we begin from a new sheet. Uh, from now going, the MPC will now probably condemn or comment or do those things. So that was how that conversation came up. It wasn't to say that uh, everything in the past should be should be should be should be forgotten and those things. No, not at all. Okay, but how do I reconcile that with that position that you say? Well, not everything in the past should be forgotten, but then again, let us forget about the past. I mean, so are you saying that some issues in the past can be remembered and held on to while we are trying to forget about the past? You see, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, we, have, we have a job ahead of us. Mm -hmm. A job to get this, our country, not into the, the way of violence. I think we have to focus on that. Indeed. You know, Indeed. Uh, but yes, if you were to recount uh, it wouldn't only come from, from one political party. Mm. Others will come with their uh, issues, you know. So that is why where it is important. Uh, you, that, I think that's why, what the chairman was pushing for, Marvin was pushing for. I see. Let's bring it closer to the place. But you can then also... Then can begin from somewhere. Right. Which, yes. is, which is fair, but you, it's a fair point. But you can also understand why others will raise concerns about... For instance, these eight people who 
were killed in the 2020 elections. No arrests have been made, no prosecution to serve as a deterrent going into this election. That, that, is, that is a blot on our democracy that cannot be easily forgotten because there are families who are still living with the grief and the, of the loss of these loved ones. It's, it's unprecedented in our electoral history to lose people, that m many people, because of an election. That certainly should be of concern as well to you, is it not? It is, it is of great concern to us, my brother. You see, uh, the last time the chairman of the Peace Council, the Reverend Dr. Nathan Jake, was speaking uh, at a forum that we partnered, uh, you know what, to do, in Kamale and in Kumasi, the chairman was clear on that matter, that it is a dent on our democracy. We cannot run away from that. But let us look at this, this concern in terms of the mandate of the Peace Council. When it happened, in March 2021, my brother, what we did was to go to all these constituents because our tools that we use to, 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 uh, to, to achieve our mandate is, is negotiation, dialogue, you know, those ADR methods. That is what we, we use. And we have been to Techiman, you just go there and ask, let somebody, your, your, your team there, let them ask. We have been there to engage. We have been to the Judo Bureau, not less than two occasions, to engage the parties. I mean, those who, who were affected. Uh, we have been to, um, uh, to all the others, Kaswa, and we have also engaged the concerns we regarded with the IGP. <coughs> We have been to the CDS. We have mm. engaged them. Right. So when we do that, we, 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 we cannot, for example, uh, I mean, the, the, the police administration has their, 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 their procedures for, for investigations and etc. cetera. And, 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 so and that's, that's where our mandate would, 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 I think, I, I think would end. Right. Then that's we right. expect that. Hello, my brother. I, yes, I, I yes, yes. You, you, you're saying you expect that what be done? Then we expect that if it is the police, they would have to use their, their mechanisms as well to continue. Okay, so we have done that. And uh, I remember the, when we met the ITC, for example, I remember he also raised some issues. You see, uh, regarding the cooperation from, from, from witnesses and others. You see, so uh, we, we, the, the Peace Council cannot be totally blamed. We may, we may not have lived up to your expectation, to, I mean, but we have taken the steps that we think can help enhance uh, our democracy and address issues that came up. Uh, this uh, eight steps, for example, again, let me tell you. Okay. Now, uh, we... we Yes, and uh, Ms. Amo, yes. I understand where your mandate ends, and I think that's quite yes. clear. But then also, the, the admission and appreciation of the fact that you may not have lived up to expectation, you know, is, is would I say, an honest one on your part that you have acknowledged some of the deficiencies or what you could have done better. For instance, when this Ayahuasca West war gone by election violence happened, there was a commission of inquiry that was established. They had a number of persons appear before them, including one of my guests, someone at a judge. Yes. Testimonies were given, questions were asked, and a white paper was issued afterwards with certain recommendations and actions to be taken so as not to have this or these incidents of violence happen in our elections in this yes. country again. If you look at the recommendations in there, practically no implementation. And, and so if I understand your mandate, but then again, if there's some sort of silence on your part on these issues, at least you, when you speak about it, that urging the powers that be to ensure that these right things are done, couldn't that have also helped? Yes, I, I think I think I will agree with you, um, and uh, we, we I think we have done that. We issued statements, press statements, 
uh, you go through the, the past. Uh, I think Google can now bring them out. Uh, if you go to our website, I think you, 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 um, you would like to see statements that we issue regarding those matters. You know, uh, that is how we can, how far we can go. I see. I issuing uh, press if, statements? Beyond that? If, 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 yeah, if, if for example, uh, we, we think that institutions such as the, 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 the House of Chiefs, the, institutions are, the, are the Council of States, uh, I mean, we should all come in and help, you see, uh, so that we are able to uh, get some of these things that we, we that is in the public, that is all resolved, you know, resolved. Uh, but the Peace Council, uh, per our mandate, you see, I think that probably we may have to do a lot of public education on things we can do and things we cannot do, uh, because uh, we don't have the, the, the power to, it is the condemnation and things that people are crying that we should do. There's nothing in our acts that, that, that uh, uh, I mean, ask the Peace Council to pronounce on, on, on matters, you know. I mean, we can't do it. Nothing could do that as well. I have to come up with that. With that. No. But right. we are also not uh, mandated to pronounce on matters like that. But that, that, that I think the courts have that mandate. You know, so uh, the peace council, let me also say, my brother, that it, it started from a point with, 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 with little clarity. I mean, those who crafted the act, uh, those who mooted the idea, will tell you, it is now that we are trying to find our foot very well. So I, I would also want to appeal to all Ghanaians, help us. The peace council is a very important institution. If we are able to get it right, I think it can do a lot of good for our democracy. You come to the northern part of Ghana, I'm here, and come and see the work the Peace Council is doing. The okay. chief 20 cases that we are handling, over 700 across the country. Right. You see, so a lot of things are happening. Let us help the Peace Council to get well established. Let us fund it well, and let it deliver. Okay. The expectations, I think, are too much. And uh, uh, we, 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 do not, we do not have that uh, capacity, as I speak to you, to meet all those uh, you know, demands that people are making on us. Well, expectations are too much. Mr. Amo, stay, because um, we'll come back to you. But I just wanted your position on some of the issues and the specific reactions as well. So don't go as yet. Um, I know you don't have money to, because um, the Peace Council is poorly funded and they have to depend on donor, donor funding for most part of their activities, which is something they would not say in public, but I know. <laughs> is it not true? I, I think Sam George is there. He'll help us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just to welcome him as well. Someone at George is <laughs> member of parliament for the Ningo Prom Prom constituency. He is a, a member of the Public Accounts Committee, in fact. And Communications Committee. And the Communications Committee. The, st still the deputy ranking? Yes. Still deputy ranking on the Communications Committee of Parliament. And also appeared before the, the Ayahuasca West Wagon Commission on this violence at the Ayahuasca West Wagon by election. It's good to have you. Good morning. Good morning, Alfred. And good morning to my brother Prince and my former boss, <laughs> YB. No, YB. Your former boss. Yeah, so all the mischief I know, he taught me. He taught you the mischief. Yes. Maybe that is <laughs> mischievous. <laughs> I'm just showing you how good a student I am. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, yeah, well, I'll start with you on this matter because, you see, the Peace Council. Oh, and let me say good morning to uh, yes, Mr. Mo, Mr. Mo as well, who's you, online. He's asking uh, for yeah. help from you. So uh, when, when you call me, I'll respond to it. <laughs> <laughs> But they, and essentially, they say the NDC's concerns from the Peace Council's perspective are fair. Some are with, outside of their mandate, they can't do anything about, but they will only engage to ensure that those things are met. But then again, that position of, of letting things go, yes, I question him on that. It's not an absolute position. They will still expect that some things be dealt with, but generally, there are specific issues that the NDC raises. And I want us to have this conversation expanding the tentacles of these conditions beyond what the NPC is asking for. Is it one that you align with? Uh, let me uh, say a very good morning to my friend, uh, Mr. Amo. Uh, 
I have known him even well before he became executive secretary of the Peace Council. And uh, let me extend my utmost respect to members of the Peace Council who, from what Mr. Amo is saying, are trying to discharge an onerous duty uh, at a great cost to uh, reputations, more or less, since they don't even have resources. So every time you step in, your reputation is at stake. But I, I also want to thank Mr. Amo for establishing the context within which the NDC's demands uh, came up. Uh, last week, the media focus was more on the demands mm -hmm. than the context. So uh, I want to come public and uh, uh, ask the public to take my remarks last week in context, because then I didn't understand the context of this, because right. it was assumed that the NDC had come up front mm. with these conditions. And, and if that was the case, my posture last week was that then it wasn't fair to the people of Ghana. The 20 million people who were going to vote could not sit by whilst uh, these conditions became a fetter to the election. So I asked for clarification whether or not their decision was to see the election held with or without their signature to a peace pact or not. Because <laughs> clearly, uh, I felt there could be parallel paths right. pursuing the six conditions uh, in a natural path of seeking good governance whilst the election organization goes on for the benefit of all Ghana. Uh, you're talking about 20 million mm. voters. But today, from what Mr. Amo is saying, these conditions appear to have come into the conversation uh, uh, sideways as a way of uh, seeking the Peace Council's uh, uh, support mm. towards their resolution. And in that context, I, I will say that the Peace Council couldn't have chosen a worse entry point and, 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 and process choice, literally, for, for, for influencing the, the outcome of these elections. Mm -hmm. Because they could have simply continued with or without resources uh, in direct and private meetings with all stakeholders on these matters, mm -hmm. the political parties, with he mentioned the National House of Chiefs, he mentioned the Council of State, and with the government, and with the associated institutions. Because what they have is an open door to everybody, even though they don't have a mandate to compel anybody. They have an open door to everybody. But then, if you wait till a few months to election and, and drum up a peace pact and go around looking for signatures, then you set the conditions for... for you know, conflictual engagement. So the process should start way before. It, it, you know, it, it, at this it, it, stage, it, 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 why it, it, are you even going to sign a peace pact when there, there is no threat to the peace? You know, the name itself, the fact that you've been, you were mobilized around peace pact signing, the, the fact that your, your, your initial approach was to broker peace because there was such tension about transitions and about democracy. And we've gotten to the point where we are fairly uh, uh, stable. We've gone back and forth. It is the symbolic nature of it. That, yeah, but that, that is the about. point. That's the entry point I'm talking about. It's symbolic. But you go in there, you, see, you sign this, and then once the conditions come up, that's what I'm saying, you could have been doing this otherwise. Symbolically, you brought the notion that allied to these conditions, there can be no peace, or there is no peace. The election is in jeopardy. The symbolic optimism that their entry point but choosing to use a peace pact approach has brought is that they suddenly put the elections in a spectrum uh, uh, that appears to be violent. Peace pact. Are we at war? Are we fighting about this election? So far, before this peace pact matter, the, the country was, everybody's heading towards uh, 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 policies. Fortunately, uh, the, the movement for change has made this a policy-focused thing. We brought a great transformational plan. Uh, uh, the NDC is struggling to launch this manifesto. The what? MPP has just launched one, which is empty. You say they are and, struggling. They are launching their manifesto today. Uh, uh, both manifestos, which are based on something else. I'll tell you what it is. Okay, that's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. But, <laughs> but we were going along, bubbling really nicely mm. and politically. Right. Then all of a sudden, we hear that... Uh, 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 the, uh, there's a need to sign a peace pact. Immediately, the impression is that there's a threat to the peace, the electoral peace. And then when there's a refusal associated with conditions that really cannot be met in three months, then right-thinking members of society will jump to the conclusion that the election is being held to ransom because these conditions cannot be met. So the way the Peace Council went about this is what I'm saying ought not to have been 
the best. And, and Mr. Amo, to come up and say that, yeah, we don't have the power, we have the mandate only to talk to people. Uh, he's self-indicting because then he, he should have kept talking to people rather than seeking uh, 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 signature at this point. Uh, because symbolic or otherwise, the, the notion, the very notion has evolved. We've gone beyond this uh, peace industry. Mm. Uh, it used to be an industry. Uh, be, everybody would be talking peace by this time. It was just MPP and DC Dopoli, and they were immersed in who would protect so, so, them so, at so police you, station you, level, and whether we mm. use vigilantes and uh, cutlasses. And that language is what brings. So, you're going now to question the relevance of the, or the pact itself. As we speak, the impact and relevance now, you say it's, it's not as compared to previous. Yeah, I'm saying they should evolve. They should adapt. Okay. They, should, they, should, they should engage on, on premises other than the established yes. norms that brought them into being. Right. At the time they came into being, they raison the earth. The very, very essence, their very essence was to bring uh, uh, more or less very fierce partisans mm. uh, together into the middle because right. there didn't seem any way these partisans could work together but right. we've seen seen transitions we've seen transitions since the peace council was formed in 2011 formally mm -hmm. and before their formal formation there, there was activity around peace a lot right. now we've seen transitions we've had eight elections uh, uh, nobody is, is really now afraid of going out of power or using chicanery or other means to stay in in power uh, in terms of violence. Uh, we hear all the talk. Uh, some reckless talk standing on platforms and we will not hand over power and we will stay in power at all mm. costs. You know, that kind of talk. <clears throat> is that reckless, concerning but... and concerning and reason why there has to be this sim symbolic, so to speak? You don't elevate um, such recklessness to the assumption of a lack of peace. When you begin to use language like that, peace, you know, you, 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 you raise specter of war. You raise the specter of violence. You but, raise you know, the specter you know, of uncertainty. Say, peace is not the absence of war, essentially. I agree. I, so if you, if you hear such statement that you, you describe as, as what? The, the, the statements made by some of these politicians going into this election. Yes. You say they are what, reckless. Yes. In ad addressing those reckless statements, yes. you don't just, you know, Sweep it under the cabinet and in say, oh, let's era, ignore it. We are not ignoring it. In this era where we have evolved to, after the successive elections we've had, after the turnovers we've had, and the consolidation of turnover culture, you can deal with that recklessness without resorting to a, a, a formality like peace pacts, signing of peace pacts. Maybe they, they can sign the same document by changing the name. Oh, <laughs> so because it is a piece because the, for the, me, okay. like I had last week, I was on right. I was one of your programs last week mm -hmm. when the matter came up. Right. And, and it came up in the context uh, of uh, the appearing to me then that the NDC was the one who had initiated and set forth these conditions. Right. You understand? So your position has changed. My After position has changed based on the analysis, uh, Mr. Amon, is that these were not okay. even frontal conditions. These came in sideways on a conversation about this. And that's legitimate. Right. If I'm, I'm conducting my election, I'm organizing myself, I'm trying to get my candidate to get out of the blocks and go and campaign, and then you come in and say, sign a peace pact. Then obviously I'll dump my frustrations on you. Mm. <laughs> because at that point, I'm not at war. At that point, I'm not even contemplating anything that's not peaceful. Right. Then you come in and bring yourself, as Ghanaians will say. Mm. Then I will, I will tell you things that you ought to be doing. That you ought to be helping me resolve this. This has to be done. That has to be done. You haven't done all those things. And you bring me this document to sign. And unfortunately, it's reported in a way as if those conditions uh, 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 were initiated. And, and so, but now, what we are saying is that uh, I think the Peace Council itself uh, must be more dynamic must evolve, must be more fluid, must, must go along with the trajectory of democratic consolidation that, that we have. And if it's more power that they want, they must be fighting to enhance uh, their mandate in order to discharge their obligations uh, much, much better. But the bottom line is that I am happy this morning that there's nothing like a precondition to elections, that the two tracks are parallel, that we are going to have our election uh, and that we are going to fight to have that election in an environment that is free from fear and violence and is fair. And mm. that meanwhile, 
the other track is that we are going all of our society is going to use all its best efforts to pursue right the conclusion of those irritating and and really debilitating some of those difficult and dire things that have happened on, on this path uh, uh, towards democracy and we are using a good governance dialogue approach we are insisting on the institutions who are responsible doing their jobs okay. in, in that area well dr Prisama, so i mean if you look back and and also the past informs our present and then shapes our future so the the essential concern if you want the underlining issue for not just the ndc but others who are looking into this space and are concerned about what has to be done beyond just the peace signing a peace pact to ensure that we still stay on the path of peace is for instance people who are still living with the the injuries their life-threatening injuries as a result of this i also by west work on by election violence committee was a commission of inquiry was established recommendations made in a white paper government hasn't implemented any we have eight people who have died in this 2020 elections no prosecutions and for you as the mpp looking at all of this how does that concern you thank you very much and then good morning to your cherished uh, viewers i think that uh, in any democratic dispensation, uh, peace is something that we must protect and safeguard. Um, if you look at the issues that have been raised in respect of the NDC's request, um, for me, I think that the request is fair um, in terms of um, some of the recommendations that were, were raised in the IOWAS uh, by-elections. Uh, but that should not prevent, uh, prevent them um, from, from signing the peace pact. It's been in existence since 2012. We had the Kumasi Peace Pact uh, Pact in 2012. We did so in 2016. We, we, we did so in 2020 as well. And going into 2024, uh, it's become like um, um, a process uh, that we've been very consistent in, in doing so. And so going in 2024, uh, one will expect that we will continue to um, strengthen the, the processes that have led into a peaceful elections that we've had over, over the years. Mm -hmm. The issues about the Ayawaso by-elections and the outcome of the recommendations of the committee, I mean, nobody will be happy to see a single soul loss as a result of elections. Elections are contestation of ideas. People submit opinions, policy proposals for the general public to decide on those proposals. Nobody should lose their life on the basis of going to cast their votes. And I think this is a settled matter that everybody understands and everybody agrees with. Losing one life is, 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 is a big deal, let alone about eight lives. But I believe that the government was very committed into investigating this matter, and that was the more reason why a committee was set up. When the committee was set up, the white paper was issued. The white paper rejected some of the recommendations and accepted some of the recommendations. The state institutions which are responsible for ensuring that some of these recommendations are implemented are there. The, some of the recommendations were in spite of the, the, the mm -hmm. policing um, so, so, for instance, I can, I can run through a few yes, for you, yes, but if you say... That we have, that the IGP has to take some steps and ensure that the, the, there's some professionalism uh, in the police service. And you cannot say that there has not been any steps uh, in, in, in that direction. So, I'll tell I you what, so some of the recommendations are for individual liabilities. This is the Iowa West Wagon Commission of Inquiry. The commission recommended that the criminal prosecution of... Wait, which document are you reading? The, the recommendations, the white paper. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. This is the white paper. Yes, so... Um, that's yes, what I'm reading. Yes, so... Let me see the yes. Okay. Essentially, it, it's saying... And I, and I read, we yeah. have the... Which, the, which part of the white paper? No, you have... Do you have it? Yes. You have it. Yes, so, so when I'm, if I'm, what I'm so reading, if you find it in the, there, I would go to individual liabilities. No, give me the number. No, 3.1. Okay. Individual liabilities. The criminal prosecution of Ernest Akumia, alias Double for the unauthorized possession of firearms under Section 1921 of the Criminal Offences Act. Also, 3.2. I don't find 3.1 and 3.2. I can... 
look for it for you. The findings and recommendation is three. Look and then you go to four individual factors responsibilities. Of I can't find that in, in the You, you in can't the find report. individual in the, in, the, um, in the white paper. I can't you, find that. You can't find the individual responsibility. Exactly, in the white paper. The recommendations, you can't find it. No, what I see is three, which is findings and recommendations. I've not seen any so sub So under the findings and recommendations, what do you see? We, there is no sub point there. It goes straight to four facts of the event of 31st. So maybe you are reading a no, different No, no, it's not. What do you see on, on the document you are reading? The document is the white paper of the report of the Commission of Inquiry into the Ayahuas mm -hmm. That's the white paper. Yes, and under there's that three. No, yes, there's three nothing under three. Recommendations. What do you see under recommendations? I have indicated to you that mm -hmm. it's 3.0 and what you are saying is not in there. I'm just reading. You, you read what so you have. So if you can you, give if, me... If you read, read what Alfred, you have. Just yes. a quick one. Just mm -hmm. give me what you are reading, the document you are reading, which so you say is a white paper. Just these indicate are the recommend Indeed. 3. So you, what? 3.1. So I you are reading... I don't have 3.1. That's what I'm but saying. You can go you, you, yes. yes. So you, you just... Make your I don't have three points. I three see. Points so what I'm saying is that um, the estate I, institutions... If, if you would have allowed no, no, just, no, so, no, that, yes. just in, so, that, so that there's clarity. In, indeed. Yeah. The document you have, if you read paragraph 6.3, page 22, you see what Alfred is talking so, about. So that's where the no, confusion no. So is. So. Do, do because, you have it? Yes. Because do, you have what I, I'm reading. I have, I have what he is reading. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm saying what he's reading... What you are what you are referencing as individual liabilities as paragraph six point three is on page twenty two. Okay. So, so you can check it and you would yeah. see the Akumia prosecution and all is all there. Yes. Six point three okay. individual liabilities. So that's liabilities. fine. So okay. So okay. So, 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 the so it's not as though it's a different document. It's just what you are where you are looking at. No, so I mean, it is I, in there. So yes. the individual prosecution or the individual liabilities. I'm saying So that. that's where the commission recommended the criminal prosecution of NS Akumia alias double for the unauthorized possession of firearms under section 1921. That has not been done. The commission recommends the criminal prosecution for the offense of assault to wit the slapping of someone, I think, that someone George by Mohammed Suleimana. The commission recommends the immediate removal of DSP Samuel Kojo Azugu from command responsibility at the Ministry of Na National Security, given his failure to appropriately command and control the SWAT team. I, I, I think you are reading a different document, so that's it, because... Um, uh, you can't find it in there as well. Because um, in this individual liability, the government accepts in part of the recommendations. Do you understand? The government does not accept part of the recommendations, so I don't know the document you are reading. But I let see. me go and, and let me make my point. So the point I'm making is that there's no justification whatsoever to say that you're not going to sign uh, a peace pact, uh, peace pact, which has been part of our democratic process over the last decade, uh, on the basis of these conditions, the state institutions must work. What they are responsible to to, to do, they must do it. The the recommendations that were made, um, the the ones that were accepted, uh, in respect of uh, the policing and in respect of the investigations that have to be done by the Ghana Police Service, we we employ the Ghana Police Service to ensure that these investigations are done, conclusions made, and made public as well. But under no circumstances should somebody, you know, uh, or any political entity hide behind some of these concerns and, and, and they refuse to do the things that we've been doing that has inured to our benefit. The peace that we're enjoying, there's no way we can sacrifice it on the altar of, uh, of any aspiration at all. This is the Ghana that we have. It is the only country that we, we, we have, and we must, at all costs, whatever it takes, to, to guard and protect it je uh, no, no, jealously, and right. to avoid situations whereby certain comments will inflate, uh, inflame passions and then uh, undermine the, 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 the integrity of right. the state and the peace we're enjoying. So that's, that's, that's my point. I am not saying that uh, the national chairman of the NDC has no legitimate reason to raise concerns. Right. He has the legitimate reason to raise those concerns, but the decision not to subscribe to an existing process that has been part and parcel of our democratic process uh, on the basis of this condition, I think is far-fetched. And that's, that, that, that's my position on that. No, the, is it the conditions are far-fetched. I'm saying that the decision not to subscribe, subscribe to the peace pact 
on the basis of these conditions are, are far fetched. The conditions that but they do have. You, do you do you? you I you think say the that conditions are fair. I, I think I think that they are fair. Fair, fair comments, some of them to to the extent that you are asking the Attorney General to come and sign, the, the IGP to come and sign, or the uh, the Supreme Court, uh, the Chief Justice to sign. I think that 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 one, it, we, we, we've, we've stretched it so much. Why is but that? Of course, I mean, the previous elections, um, it was the presidential candidates mm -hmm. who are parties to the elections who subscribe to the Peace, peace Pact. If you want to stretch it, you could even ask the National House of Chiefs to come and sign as well. We don't have to go to that extent. There are legitimate concerns in respect of events that have occurred and that investigations have been done and people are expecting that the outcome of those investigations are conclusive and made public. And I will encourage the state institutions to do that. And everybody within the party, within the MPP, and I believe government itself, is committed to ensuring that we secure the peace of this country. The MPP believes that it has done enough for this country in respect of the policies and programs that mm -hmm. we have espoused and implemented. And we believe that we, we, as far as what we have done in respect of the, 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 policies intervention, the policy interventions, the Ghanaian people will buy the, 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 our achievement and give us the mandate and that we will win the election. That's our belief. That's our belief. The NDC also believes that they can win the election. At the end of the day, when we go to poll, um, the Ghanaian people will make their choice. And His Excellency, the President of the Republic, is very committed to handing over power and in, in, in the very unlikely event that the N, 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 NPP doesn't win. But for, for, for anybody to say that he has to come and indicate that he will, he will hand power if we don't win the election is, is again, is, is, is far-fetched. I mean, the, the, the laws are very clear. Um, we, we operate within the constitutional uh, a framework that you have no business to hang but, on to power if you haven't won the election. But we believe that we're going to win the election. And it's, it's very easy for anybody to say, it's allowed for anybody to say that, oh, we're going to win the election. We are very determined to hold on power that we win the election at all by, by all means. These are very but, but if you, fair you, comments, uh, you know, to, to in, make, uh, to, to be able to incite, uh, excite your base for them to, ver to work hard. But that does not suggest that you, in, the, in, the, in the unlikely event that we lose power, we're not going to... to and if, if it was just to Which is one of the bases base. why the, yeah. the national chairman of the NDC is asking mm. that uh, um, the, the president declares his, his, his willingness to hand power if, you know, at, at the end of the elections. But it was these comments that you say were made, reason why it's even generated a concern for the NDC to even put up this demand. You say it was just to excite your base. So, for instance, what Brian H. Champon said, even the president at some point has said himself, okay, that he doesn't see himself and know about to, or having Jomahama succeed him. I mean, those comments are being described as reckless. Was that necessary just to excite the base and not look beyond the signal or the kind of mindset that that sends in terms of the optics for that matter was just just to excite the base the, the and not look beyond po what this could bring? political statements are aspirational you these are your aspirations you 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 hope that you're going to win the election you believe that you're going to win the election you believe that on the 7th of january 2025 you're going to hand over power to his excellency uh, dr mahmoud baumia that is his belief but if the but, but, people but, po vote otherwise uh, yes that, that's fine belief and knowledge are the extent so that is his belief and you cannot uh, fault him for holding that belief okay and that 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 should not be the basis to say that he's not going to hold power. These are aspirations. This is our wish. This is our greatest wish, that 7th January, with that, when, when the, the president is handing over, he hands over to Cecilency, the vice president of the Republic of Ghana, to continue the good work that this government has done. Okay. This is the belief and this is the wish of every member of the new patriotic party, and I believe the greater majority of Ghanaians. But if in the unlikely event, it turns out to be the other way, I mean, what, what, what can you do about it? There's nothing you can do about it. In 2008, President Kufo believed strongly, strongly that he was going to hand over power to the, the, the uh, uh, MPP candidate, His Excellency Nenadu Dankwa Kufuado. 
And it, had, it didn't happen that way. But he handed over power. So once you, you, you live within the confines of democratic governance and the rules, there's nothing that you can do. President Mahama wished that he had had the chance to rule Ghana in 2016, mm -hmm. after the 2016 election. But he lost the election, and there's nothing he could do about it. So it is, I, for me, for me it's, it's, there's nothing wrong uh, aspiring and, and, and holding, the, holding belief that uh, you are going to win the election and then hand over to a, a, a member, of, uh, the flag bearer of the MPP. And that should not be the basis to say that the, that statement is reckless. For me, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it from that angle well, at all. Well, let me bring Mr. George on this. And just to, to set the record straight and put the matters in context, the specific um, part of that document that makes the individual liabilities recommendations 6.3, Let's just read that briefly, just to put the issues in context, then we, we can go on to the other matters. Okay, um, thank you, and once again, very good morning to everyone here. Okay. Um, the 6.3 individual liabilities, it says, the government accepts in part the recommendations of the commission in respect of the individual liabilities as captured at paragraph 8.3 on page 58 of the report. The government makes the following comments on the recommendations regarding individual liabilities by the Commission. Mm -hmm. A. The government takes note of the Commission's recommendations that Mr. Enes Akumia, a, alias Double, must be prosecuted for the unauthorized possession of firearms under subsection 1 of section 192 of the Criminal Offences Act 1960, Act 29, and refers that recommendation to the Criminal Investigation Department of the Ghana Police Service for further investigations. Mm -hmm. B, the government does not accept the commission's recommendations that Mohammed Suleimana must be prosecuted for the offense of assault to meet the slapping of the Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Samuel Nati George, okay. on the basis that the commission at paragraph 6.1 and 6.2 on page 55 of the report accepted the facts which led to the said assault on the Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Samuel Nati George, which facts support a valid defense of provocation for the said assault. C. Right. It goes on and on. I mean, mm -hmm. it goes all the way to... Uh, yes, just... Uh, but just, it establishes mm -hmm. the fact that there are individual liabilities. It goes on to talk about... Okay. Um, in C, it talks about um, referring the Commission's recommendation in 8.3.3 okay. on page 58 on the IGP for its, consider mm -hmm. IGP for its consideration mm -hmm. and all of that. Look, let me start by saying that... Okay. I've listened to the entire conversation and... Mr. Mo has been very candid. The Peace Council, from his rendition to us, and it's a position I've held previously, mm -hmm. adds no value to our political discourse. Adds no value? Absolutely no value. The Peace Council is a drain on the public person and should be disbanded. It serves no purpose. Because the Peace Council, per what Mr. Amo himself has said to us, has no powers to enforce peace. The Peace Council is one that issues press conferences as and when they will, especially during election seasons, goes to sleep for another three and a half years, wakes up three months to an election and starts issuing press statements again. The Peace Council in itself or on its own through Mr. Amor has admitted that they have failed in the past. When institutions fail, we disband them. I mean, when, when they fail to live up to their expectations and mandate, I mean, you disband them. And let's, let's set this whole conversation in context. The NDC did not invite the Peace Council. In fact, the national chairman of the NDC was literally, literally ambushed because he got a letter, and I'm stating this on the record. Mr. Mm -hmm. Sidin Ketia got a letter requesting audience from the Peace Council. He shows up at the meeting in his office, and the Peace Council is there with a plethora of media people. He was absolutely not informed that the media was even going to be present. He wasn't informed? Absolutely not. So he tells them that, ah, but you, you are coming to my house. You have requested for a meeting with me. You are coming to my house. You don't tell me you are coming with media. If you even wanted the media here, I should be arranging the media. It's my house. I set the rules. Then they say, okay, then we'll let the media go. Then they say, oh, don't worry. Let the media stay. There is nothing I will say indoors that I can't say outdoor. Mm -hmm. And goes ahead to, to, to set the Peace Council right. But, I mean, this is the level of ambush. And... If the Peace Council was really minded and interested in dealing with the peace of our country, I don't think a Peace Council should be starting with the NDC. First, and foremost, first and foremost, the NDC has not 
led or occasioned the killing of eight Ghanaian citizens. The NDC has not supervised and led the maiming and killing of persons in a by-election. The NDC has not had its members make mindful, mindless effusions and hallucinations that can only come from heavily deluded minds. The NDC has not done any of those. There's only one political party in our country today that's beating the drums of war, that has gone ahead to exact violence on innocent Ghanaian citizens, the MPP. And they have not gone to the MPP. They've come. So it's like you have, you have two people in a, in, in, in standing there. One is provoking and, and attacking the other person. And you're not stopping the agent provocateur. What you're doing is attacking the peaceful person who is being attacked and being, telling him, you don't worry, just hold your hands. I mean, the Peace Council should at least credit Ghanaians with some level of intelligence. You know, I've seen a lot of messages on my phone since the introductions were done where people have drawn my attention. And even I raised it when I arrived that uh, my former boss, Honorable Yabwa Bing, was on your platform earlier this week and said I lied at the commission. I'll be grateful if he states for the public what lie I told at the commission when I appeared before the commission so that we set the record straight. He but at the commission. <laughs> or, or wherever. And my remarks mm -hmm. about your attitude and conduct during the actual event, not at the commission. I didn't say you lied at if you, and, you, and, you and commissions, to appear at commissions, the commission. How well, well, you should. You, we'll we'll come to that. We'll come to that. But I'll, I'll be grateful to know what it is that you said. I, I, I lie about. Let's, let's, let's but, but I dealt. I dealt with all the issues before the commission. In fact, media pundits have stated that of all the persons who appeared before the commission, I was the most coherent and the most believable. Because you, if you followed my testimony compared to what others came to do there, the facts were straight. But look, you have a government that presided over the dastardly acts at the House of West Wogan. Just three weeks ago, I visited with the family of Ishao Yaro because his mother had passed. Ishao Yaro was on his way to Europe to go and earn living for his family as a footballer. He had been invited for trials. After almost 12 surgeries, his leg, he still can't walk on it. And the individuals who perpetrated such heinous crime are still walking around and being paid with our taxes. Because the, President Akufuado and Brian Echampo, absolutely. Because mm. President Akufuado and Brian Echampo, who oversaw that, have sat quietly and continued to proceed and go ahead with carrying out what, what was a test run in Ayahuasca West Wagon. In Ayahuasca West Wagon, they maimed, hit, and assaulted. A few months down the line, because the Peace Council failed in its job to ensure that, look, justice was delivered. What did you see? You saw the killing of eight people. What did the Peace Council do apart from issuing statements calling for peace and prosecution? It was about calling for peace and prosecution. We don't need a Peace Council. What can peace, the Peace Council do? Or what could they have done beyond If that? they can't do anything beyond that, then it's for want of a better... For, and I don't want to call them useless, but then they, ha they have no use. They have no use to this country they have because a mandate. what's their mandate do you issue press statements is that what it is and come and call on the people who are victims and when mr mo talks about the peace council success he says that they went to visit with the victims in in techiman and the victims you know the, the real deal the victims don't need your visit they want justice it is about justice there can be no justice or there can be no peace without justice so you cannot be asking us to sign to a peace pact when you are not demanding justice for the people, you sit and drink tea with the president. You go to meetings with the president and you don't chastise the president. Show me a message of the Peace Council chastising the president. The president is commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. It is not vigilantes from anywhere. It is men in Ghana Armed Forces uniform. Seven members of the Armed Forces are, are noble Armed Forces. Whether they were put in there by, as hoodlums by the president and his henchmen well, well, or whatever. So, so are you saying NSA double is still serving? Oh. Have you seen anything moving double from national security? Samuel Kojo Azugu still serving. Absolutely. Mohamed Suleimana. And when you read that recommendation, I mean, the fact that the MPP touts itself as a party of lawyers. And lawyer YB had been in the MPP for a very long time, but he's a senior I'm lawyer. By now, he's no longer in the MPP. But you see, but you see, MPP he will this. tell you, he will tell you that there is nowhere in our legal jurisprudence where provocation 
It's a defense for us. Dr. Hammer will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> provocation <laughs> cannot, in, in our legal jurisprudence, mm -hmm. provocation is not a valid defense for assault. Yet our Attorney General wrote that and gleefully sp spelled that out. But you see, that, that, tells you, that tells you where we sit as a country. That we sit as a country where, when Brian A. Champo made the comment about, we will not hand over power, we will not hand over power. He's, he's not made that comment once. Oh. The first time he made that comment, I said to him that, look, Brian, you can choose to make such reckless comments. But bear in mind that the cost of a gallon of fuel and a, match, and a box of matches is not that expensive. You may have the money to train mercenaries and visit harm on people, but know that you cannot run away. Brian has moved his children out of school in Ghana and sent his children outside because he thinks he's going to run away with his family. Well, well, but we, tell we, Brian we, we, that we, wherever we his that. children are, they are not we, we, away we, 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 from the reach of anybody. Let, let, because you see, let, let, we need to let back. people know let, we yes, are, we are on back. the issue of peace. Indeed. You see, let's I speak with passion because Brian was the one who orchestrated those attacks on myself and the so, people so, in our so West Wagon. And today, that same person has been rewarded by President Akufuado with a cabinet ministry so, position. So, you, you see, he, when the Peace the Council sits down and allows such injustice to go on in the country, and then you turn around and come to tell us that we should sign some peace. Look, I said, don't get your charitable to them. If they had come to me with me, with a peace agreement, I've torn it and torn it This, this is their mandate to manage, resolve, and prevent conflict. Would Mr. Amo be talking about peace if, peace if his child that, was one of the eight people who were killed by hoodlums in Ghana Armed Forces uniform on the instructions of the Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces? Would Mr. Amo be talking? Would Mr. Amo be talking about a peace contract or demanding justice? Would the what? people who sit at the peace council? The so-called peace council. Would any of them, if any of their family members were killed in Aya, so, in, in a, were hurt, hurt in Aya or so West Wagon, if so, any of their family members were killed, look, Chief, I have met the people who were victimized, victims of Aya or so West Wagon. I have met the families whose children were killed. Their only crime was that they went to exercise a constitutional franchise that they have to vote for a, a, a candidate of their choice. They were shot and killed point blank. Look. We're sitting here in this country, and today, the same person, the same person who orchestrated the Yarosu West Wagon, the same person who we are told is training people in, in, do, in the do, Eastern do, region. Do you have any today, evidence to that effect? Today, we, today, we don't know has, that. Has he come out, has he come out to deny it? We, we cannot has he come out to deny it? With that, but you see, we, we, we I, am not, I don't blame Brian. I don't blame we, we, Brian. We, we, Brian will behave the way he's behaving because you have a reckless but, and irresponsible but, but, but president. Again, but, no, no, but, listen, listen. But, no, no, no. Look, no, no look, hold, hold on. Oh, Alfred, yes, when yes, everybody yes, was yes, talking, yes, you relax. made them make their point. I'm asking him not to interject. Okay. Listen. Make your point. And the point I'm making is this. Brian will be emboldened to make his reckless comments because you have an irresponsible president at the time of affairs. Why, why would you describe him as that? No, if I mean, the president I, 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 was not I, irresponsible, some, some, look, it is the height of irresponsibility. Some, wait, 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 listen. No, Mr. John, oh. Mr. John, why would you say that? How different I mean, is irresponsible so, so, from incompetent? So, 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 they call Bahama yeah, incompetent. If the president is being so, so, irresponsible, so, 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 the president, on, let, on what let, basis? I'll really? tell you, I'll tell you. Really? The president, the, the, let me tell you, the president is commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces, ultimate commander of the, of, of, of Ghana's noble armed forces. Men wearing armed forces uniform went and killed eight citizens under his watch. The president is, had been touted to us and sold to us, wrongfully so, as a defender of civil liberties and human rights. Why, those eight citizens don't, don't have liberties and human rights? Has the president even acknowledged the death of the eight people? The president has addressed this nation, wait, four times. Four times in Parliament. I've sat in Parliament with you four times for the President to come and do the State of the Nation's address. Since eight citizens were killed, the President has not acknowledged the death of the eight citizens. Is that responsible or irresponsible leadership? The President has overseen. Wait. The President was President when I also West War One happened. What has the President said about the, the findings of, of I also West War One post the, the white paper? The President is the first person 
to go and stand on a political party platform and say, yeah, me, 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 hand me, 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 has this enjoyed the largesse of this no, state no, no, for no, no, eight no, years. No, 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 he will no, no, hand no, no, over no, no, power no, no, when the Ghanaian people no, vote. Listen, when, when, no, when, no, when, no, when, no, when no, President no, Rawlings, no, even no, President Rawlings, no, even no, President Rawlings, no, he handed over to President Kufuor. No, I said I didn't call him. I said his his rantings are the effusions of a deluded mind. Mr. George, Mr. George, hold, 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 gentlemen, don't do that. Oh, you think today today is cutting you, eh? Gentlemen, gentlemen, don't do that, gentlemen. Hey guys, do not do gentlemen. That. How can you describe there was the president a specific this question that I asked because he's behaving about, in that such manner. Hold on. How? He's behaving in such on. manner. Gentlemen. What do you seek to achieve uh, no, when you do Prince that? I'm, 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 well, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking. Prince is the one talking. No. Now, there was a specific statement that was made earlier. I asked questions about exactly when what you meant by that. Yes. Now, because of the expression yes and i wanted the context in which you yes. made that statement yes you have explained yes that context yes it is the expression that was used that i have issues and concerns with did you make a specific reference to the president having a delusional mind or i said on that? the president no, i want that to be yes sir, to i'm, be I'm right. answering you yes. you've asked my question yes i said the president's comments yes. are hallucinatory and they are they are effusions, they are mindless effusions of a deluded mind. And those the comments. Yes, I said the president's comments. His comments that he will not hand over power to Muhammad, even if the people of Ghana votes to him, are hallucinatory. Because if you are not hallucinating, you cannot say that the people of Ghana will vote. They will vote for someone, and then you will say that I will not hand over power to that person. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who, who so does the you, president think he so, is? So that you, when the Ghanaian people you, vote for you someone, you disagree with the, Would you disagree oh. with that position? And I say, you, and I repeat again, not, I repeat so, again so, that there so, are mindless so, effusions yeah. so, of a deluded so, mind. So, in effect, yeah. you disagree with that position. Absolutely, hold, very strongly, yeah. and state that the president, view. the president needs to wake up and smell the coffee and know that every President Rawlings handed over to President Kufo, and that President Kufo handed over to Professor Mills. And that John Mahama handed over to him. And that he, he will hand over to someone who the Ghanaian people choose. Hopefully John but Jamani you are, you are saying the same thing that the as same talking about. That, that so, so, so when the president, if the president, if the president oh. is not making, if, if his comments were not those of a deluded mind, he will mm -hmm. not stand anywhere and but, say but, he won't but, hand over but, power. But, Sam George, I don't want yeah. you to re repeat that or make George. that reference. Why? Why? Respectfully. Why? It is deluded minds that make such you claims. Made, you have made your point yes. without even having to make that reference. Oh, no, no. It's important that we put it in, in context. In, in, in Listen, that particular Alfred, you see, Alfred, Alfred, you see, let me tell you something. It is all of this. It is all of this reckless comment mm. coming from people who ought to know better. Mm. That leads a country to the precipice where if you are not careful, disaster happens and you cannot return from. And you see, it is trying to manage and placate the egos, overblown egos of people that have led countries down the drain. Because people feel that, oh, let's not say this about the president. Let's so not say this not about, so the about the minister. I, 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 it's not about the person. It's, it's about, about the, the comments the person it's, is it's, making. It's, it's, it's about the office. But if the occupant the of the office, office, if the occupant of the office is you behaving in a manner. Office, is it not? No, listen. And I have utmost respect for the office of the president. Mm -hmm. But if the occupant of that office mm -hmm. is not conducting so, so. himself in a manner... Listen, let me tell you something. President Kufo, I may not agree with him and his politics, but I respect him for one thing. On the 3rd of January, hmm? was it 3rd of January or 3rd, 31st December 2008, eve of New Year, he addressed the nation. And he said, and that was when we were going to time. It was a razor thin thing, razor thing. In fact, that's the closest election in Ghana's history. President Kufo said, go to time, EC, hold the elections. I will hand over on the 7th of January to whoever the people elect. Like him or hate him, he's a Democrat. 
He respected the principles of democracy. A man who has benefited from that process of democracy today says that if the people democratically elect someone who is not his choice, he won't hand over to. And you think that we should clap what? and respect such a person? You think that we should what, what, clap and sing songs and, and mm, placate and massage the over bloated egos of such what, people? What, what, the, the Peace Council is saying that these conditions you're asking them for, some of them are outside of their mandate. So what do they do? So then they should shut up shop and go home. They should close shop, go home. And leave us, leave us, they should, they should close shop, go home. Because if the Peace Council has no room or power to take care of those things, then they cannot be asking us to commit to something that they can't enforce. We signed a peace pact in 2020, did we not? Did the Peace Council not bring a peace agreement for the NDC to sign? Did we not sign it? We signed it, I think, in, in the presence of Utu for uh, 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 Asante Hene. True or false? True. We signed the peace it's pact right. in 2020. In 2020, we went to Kumasi and it's signed a peace pact. No, 2020. 2020 happened in Moving Peak. In Moving Peak. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. It, but there was, we signed the peace pact in yes. 2020. Good. What was the peace pact about? That we signed. That the elections will be peaceful. That they will be free and fair. The Electoral Commission announced six different results. Did that look like a free and fair election? Eight people were killed. What has the Peace Council done about it? So if we sign that peace pact, and it could not protect citizens, and it could not seek justice for the citizens, it could not hold people accountable for their failures and inactions, you've come back again to us that we should sign another one, and you expect us. If the national executives of the NDC sign a peace, peace, peace pact, some of us will lead a revolt against them within the party. What was because it? it then means that our leadership is not caring and thinking about the rank and file of our party. But I'm glad that I trust the leadership of Asedu Nketiah. And he's made it clear we will not sign. If they don't meet those demands, they, they, they shouldn't come to us with any peace pact. We don't need any peace pact. We would carry out the election in our own manner. We would defend our people at the ballot boxes. We would defend the will of the people. And let notice be hereby served. To President Akufuado, Brian yeah, Champong, yeah, and every yeah. one of those who think that Ghana belongs well, to them. Well, Ghana does not belong to them. And the will of the Ghanaian people will be enforced and protected at the ballot box at all costs. Well, that is one thing we will it's we'll assure them. Some of the hour. We cannot associate with some of the things said. Easy. That said, um, uh, Mr. Amo is on the telephone. I need to have him quickly respond. Mr. Amo? This is the concern that the Peace Council, in fact, has to address. But then again, the fundamental question about what you've done beyond these press statements is where the issue is, Ms. Amo. What, what, what could the Peace Council have done that you agree, as you indicated, you could have done better previously? Yeah, I, okay. I, where I am, I don't even get TV3. So uh, I, was, I was out for some time. Um, I, I see. I, you, I, you, you don't, your, your TV can't get this channel? Yes. Where I am. Are you yeah, in Accra? I'm, I'm, I'm in a rural place. Um, You're in a rural place? Been, yes, doing the peace work. <laughs> you know, uh, somewhere. That's, that's so, strange. You, let, let, me, let me quickly. You see, I would, I would, encourage, I would encourage all the panelists there. Um, Kendall, retired, Professor Sabwadi has written an article on peace facts. And uh, I would encourage that we all read that. It, 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 it makes a lot of revelation. Uh, but let me reiterate that the Peace Council did not go to the, the, the head office of the National Democratic Congress to ask the party to sign to a peace party. We were there uh, to introduce a committee, a committee to monitor the code of conduct of political parties. That was the mission. And uh, as, 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 uh, as one of the, the outcomes, you know, uh, the issue of the peace pact came up. So uh, please, let me, let, me, let, me, let me make that one clear. And also to state, um, Alfred, that a lot of things are happening. And uh, we want to uh, uh, conduct the research uh, probably into um, the, the, the effect of the peace pact. We wanted to do that. We couldn't get the, the support to do it. Uh, there were some partners who wanted to support us, but along the path, uh, I think the other resources all ran out, so we couldn't do that. But I think we have to, we have to conduct a research into uh, the, the impact of 
of, of, of this atmosphere alone, but other places. You know, I haven't said this, uh, Alfred. The Prince Council has done a lot together with the NDC and the MPP and all the other parties since 2012. We met at Aqua Safari in Ada, July 2021, you know, to review the election. Some recommendations were made. Those recommendations included the return of the NDC to the IPAC uh, mechanism. You remember that on December 14, 2013, 1823, sorry, the NDC publicly de declared its intention to return to the IPAC. I'm happy that we've been able to achieve that. It happened on our platform. We have set up the inter-party uh, committee for political parties. So every quarter, we meet with the political parties. And all the chairmen, the new chairman uh, of uh, NDC and NPP, the general secretaries, they all participated in these meetings. We have organized training for for on mediation for the political parties. And all the parties have been present. Our, our, our position is that we should assist the political parties to develop mechanisms to deal with internal issues. If they're able to do that very well, it helps in, 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 in promoting peace in, across the parties and in the country. And in all of them, both the NDC and MPP have actively participated. And I think that it is probably as a result of some of these things that the NDC has set up an ADI committee headed by uh, my friend Amalba. I know MPP is doing something similar. We will continue to work to instill mechanisms that will promote peace in our country. I think that we should all support to make the Peace Council that body we all, we all want to see. You see, if we, are, if we look at deficiencies of of institutions, I think every institution in this country has one or the other. I don't think parliament is immune. I don't think the media is immune. We all, at one point or the other, uh, uh, fall short of, of expectations. So I think that let us play the peace council in, in a position that it will be encouraged to do the work the law has set up to do. I want to encourage that. And we mean very well. Look at the members of the Peace Council. Just have a look at the members. There was a time somebody who I, I respected a lot did not even know that uh, the, the, the members have made up of, I mean, people from, I mean, the institution that access we should, we should, we should, they should compose the Peace Council. Four from the Christian side, three from the, the Islamic side, one from the traditional religion side, uh, two from civil society. The government has just two appointments out of 13. It is, so we are doing quite a lot. As I speak to you, the 16 regional offices are handling, I think I've said this year, almost 700 cases. Kids fancy to land, to community violence, to political issues. We are dealing with that. So uh, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity and to encourage all the panel members there. Uh, my, my senior, Yabwabe uh, yeah, yeah, Samoa, is there. Uh, I think we have worked closely with all the political parties. And those who attend our meeting this year, uh, Alfred, let me tell you, we've met for the first time the Council of Elders of both NDC and NPP. It was a very fantastic meeting. Mr. Hudi Yaya was there. Mr. Hakwan Ushagman was present. The former speaker, uh, Right Honorable Michael Kui, was present. Uh, uh, Honorable Victor who was present. And they are all encouraging the Peace Council. We think that we should all do the same. You know, between the court and conflict, if, 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 if we, we, we want win-win, then I think the Peace Council is the alternative. We have our weaknesses, but let us help the Peace Council to stand up to the challenges that it's, it's, it's currently confronting. So I'm all, thank you very much. And that the candid position that you take is what, um, in fact, all my guests here
align with and the help that you are asking for as well. Maybe the, the mandate as well is where your limitations are, which you look at, and your funding issues as well, which you, you, you have put out earlier. Uh, George Amon is Executive Secretary to the National Peace Council. Thank you for joining us. In fact, Doc, I'll give you the final word on this matter. Yeah, we I have think to that, uh, I mean, I've made mm -hmm. my point. I, in I forging I, ahead. In, in, in going forward, mm -hmm. but I think I need to make this point that we have to, as leaders of this country, avoid using intemperate language. I'm quite very disappointed the way my, my brother, you know, described uh, His Excellency the President in that despicable manner. It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, un, unacceptable. And I know that when he goes home and watch the video and reflect over the things he said, he'll probably will apologize to the President for the words that he used. We, as leaders, we have to demonstrate leadership. The young people out there are looking up to us. I'm not sure that I, I would be very comfortable seeing anybody anywhere describing um, my, my colleague in, in the manner that he has described His Excellency the President. I think we have to avoid that at all costs. Elections are contestation of ideas. Democracy, the beauty of democracy is that you, you make policy proposals and then make arguments for, 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 for people to buy into your policy proposals. And the best candidates, not normally, normally, not even the best candidate that, 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 that wins. Otherwise, the Nana Adran Kwaku for the President would have won in 20, 2012. It is the way the message is packaged that results in winning an election. I don't think that under no, there should be any circumstances whatsoever that we will we will resort to any other means of governing ourselves apart from this process that we have agreed and subscribed to uh, in terms of going for elections. And I believe that the Peace Council, in my respective, op uh, 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 my, in my opinion, I think the Peace Council is a very important national institution in deepening our democracy ensuring that tolerance is strengthened across the country. They've got offices in the district and the region, and they are playing a key role uh, in, in that regard. And I believe if we are able to resource them well, they can do well and ensure that uh, the, the peace that we have enjoyed over the last uh, three decades will continue to, 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 to enjoy that. I want to implore on the National Democratic Congress to, to tone down in some of these utterances as we go into 2024 election. There is already um, a determination as to who will win the election. It's in the hands of the, 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 the Ghanaian people. They have seen the, the government of His Excellency Nana Dodako Akufuado, right. the experience that of Mr. John Dramani Mahama, and they can make a better choice uh, between the candidate of His Excellency uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baomia and the uh, uh, former president Mahama. And at the end of the day, whoever is elected, I, I, I have said this, it is my greatest wish uh, that uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baomia is given the mandate, given his deep understanding of the social economic situation we find ourselves at this current moment. If it, in the very unlikely event, it doesn't happen that way. Life goes on, but there's no need to be, you know, uh, speaking in a manner that incites and, uh, and inflame um, uh, passions and also undermine the, the peace and in integrity of the state. Certainly so. And Mr. George, I'll take your final word on this matter. And I needed to make it quite clear about the position earlier taken because I asked specific questions on that to ensure that there's some level of clarity going forward because some statements cannot and should not be countenanced. And that's why I dwelt a bit more on that. While you conclude, I want us to address this particular issue of the specific reference you made to the statement that the president made. Alfred, mm. I will state for emphasis, and let, let me be clear to my brother Hamid, I have not insulted the president, and I don't intend to insult the president. Right. I have made references to the pronouncements of the president and described those pronouncements. I have not described the president. Yeah, oh, oh, oh. No, okay. no, no. So, you see what, no, can I, yeah, when, yes, when he was talking, yes, I was yes. quiet. I Prince. mean, listen, Prince, 
Speaking truth to authority and power is a painful exercise for those in power, but it's a necessary tool for the building of a, of a nation. And so I will not shy away from commending the president when he gets it right. When he was in my constituency to commission a project, your party goes around with that video saying Sam George was praising name. When he gets it wrong, I will tell him to his face, Mr. President, you are wrong. And when the president makes those kinds of pronouncements that he will not hand over power to someone who he is not comfortable with, let the president know. Take it to the president. He has no such mm -hmm. power to make such determinations. You understand me? Okay. But again, the last point I'll make is the point Prince just made in his submission, that he's calling on the NDC to tone down. Are we, are we joking or are we serious? What has, the NDC, what, what has the NDC done that we should tone down? Prince, you have not called out your colleague minister and our colleague in parliament, Barney Champong, for his reckless comments. That you don't think is reckless? Well, he said he if, you can't, if you can't call out the president, because I know he's your appointee, yeah, but, your appo appointor, yeah. you are his appointee, so you can't call out the president. Your colleague but, minister, you can't call him out? You think what Brian said, has said on two occasions, is right? I mean, we all speak about how much of a gentleman you are, and I don't doubt that at all. And you know my personal relationship with you. But I don't also think that you should sit here and pretend that there is everything kosher and everything right and everything cool. You speak about the young people looking up to us. The young people expect that you would point out what is right and what is wrong. And the young people of Ghana expect that you will be able to tell Brian that, look, my brother, I think you overstepped. You got it wrong there. But if you fail to do that, then I would begin to question okay, the basis so, on which you are making, because I'm, I want you to tell me what the NDC said that you think we should tone down. And I'm still waiting for Honorable uh, uh, Samoa to let me know what lie I said anywhere. I have never told a lie relative to Ayaso West Wagon. It okay. is my reality I lived, it is my lived reality, and I state for the records here and now that unless he can point out what it is that I said that was a lie, the truth and the facts. I, yeah, I, want, to say, so finally. I also want to put it on record. Yes. I don't have an appetite for raking up what has happened before okay. in this era when we right. are focused on an upcoming election. We're just because, an just because, election. Why, because yeah, you made those comments. comments. Yes, no, yes made I made those comments three because days ago. I made the okay. comment Why, on the basis of we what you did. Let me laugh. What did I do? No, 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 gentlemen. Your attitude during the IOS West war gone situation and what, what you said post the what uh, was was what one situation what? i never said anything about your appearance before that you said what you were shot at you said several policemen shot at you i and said i so? came out and said no it is a lie because you couldn't demonstrate if you had been shot at in the terms you said you had been shot at you wouldn't be alive to say the things you were saying that's what i said and that's what you said at the time and that's how i responded that is my position on it i am not interested in a post-mortem okay. i am interested in going forward and it's right. unfortunate the peace council has brought this back in this contest just because of the entry point they and chose they, they have a mandate they must pursue their mandate, but I think they must evolve. Okay. And in evolving, they must appreciate where consolidation processes have reached and the kind of issues that drive elections going right. forward. If they want to intervene, they must look carefully at how they intervene and the kind the of positions point. they take towards those interventions. Alfred, you know, give me 30 seconds. Thank Just 30 seconds and on I'm this. And I'm counting on this. And look, I, I, I don't need, I I don't need, have an I don't need for this. Party oh, 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 Honorable YB, whether you have an appetite okay. or not, the facts so, are the facts. So, so, but no, let me just no, say, no, let me just say the facts. We can oh, go the commission, back to the commission, the commission, the commission of the empire. No, no, no. You even refuse to go there. I want to also put it on record. I never commented on your appearance at the commission. If you don't listen to what I'm saying, I'm not saying to say it I didn't. I'm saying to you that I didn't comment on your appearance at the commission. I didn't. Thank you. Alfred. The Commission of Inquiry established whether there were gunshots or not. They, they listened to tapes from the media, not from me. Okay. You, oh. after that event, came oh. out and said you oh. had been shot at the The Commission, the Commission, I stated, right. so, right. so, now going forward to you, what you, the Commission you, said. You've said what you... So yeah. Because the Commission's the findings... If you allow right, this to go no, this way... No, why be, if you lied about me on TV, allow me to expose the fact that you lied about me. No, if there's anybody who stole a lie about anybody here, it's you. You weren't at Ayala, so West 
Westwogon. You were that I also Westwogon. I was there. Listen, Alfred, Alfred, and Alfred. came out. No, you came out. No, Alfred, you shouldn't do this. Whenever you, except you let me speak, but whenever I speak, I won't. And I told you that it was not true because if several policemen are shot at you, you will not be alive. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, but I'll be you uh, thank you very much. He's a can former, I, I former uh, uh, the communications director of the N NPP. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. I stated emphatically. No, no, I, I just, I just, I just. Why be? No, let me state right. the facts. Why are you? Why are you being disrupted? Do so. Thank you. Yes. I stated emphatically that if you look at the wall of the the the, the candidate's house, it was zigzag, and that I was right. in between the spaces there, okay. and shots were fired there. Okay. That's what I told the media. Now the commission itself moved in situ went to the location, found that the walls are the same way I spoke about it. The commission found the bullet holes in the wall. The commission listened to tape recordings that counted over 60 gunshots, went to the site with national uh, ballistic forensic experts and identified 63. It's all in the commission's report. Mm -hmm. So it is not Sam George saying. So when I say to you that I was present and there were gunshots and that I stayed against the wall in the crevices in the wall, the commission went and found that my testimony was true. The commission did not dispute it. If there's anybody who said anything okay. that's incorrect, well, well, it is you. Second. Yes, indeed. So I am saying that I'm not talking about what you said at the commission. Or okay. what the commission You're not said listening to right. me, Why? If you are, that, um, because I what I said, said was, was what, what I said was corroborated by the commission. I'm giving right. you a dose of your So, 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 so I reacted immediately to what you said when you came out of your so-called crevice in the wall, your hiding place in the wall. You said, and I repeat, that police, several police have shot at you. Okay, well, at that time, you, 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 you were standing and they shot at you, and the at bullet was in your hand. I came out and reacted that you, 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 you came and sat here. When I was here, you came and sat here and just made allegations that we don't need to be alive. I am standing the world that you have been shot Let's hear from, it's three minutes to the top of the hour. There's the next issue. Lawyer Martin Pebo is on Zoom with us. Counsel, good morning. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, and you, uh, yes, yeah. no, 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 no. Long ago, please. Now, and I'll give you the final word. Yes, I know you have some few words here on this matter because, in the end, you are also a stakeholder in your own right in this quest to maintain the peace that we are enjoying as a people. Now, the Peace Council has acknowledged its limitations but they are asking for help in the process of executing their mandate. In the quest to give them help, what should, what should be done? And then also, what should the major stakeholders, political parties also do to complement the, the little that the Peace Council is doing? Okay, so the first is that the Peace Council itself has been nonchalant they, they've not shown that they are capable of doing this work, right? Yeah, because, you see, when you read the Peace Council Act, okay, there is part of it where they are supposed to have mechanisms for early warning systems, early warning systems or early warning mechanisms, okay? So they're supposed to see the problems. I don't, I can't for one second imagine how the Peace Council went to meet Isia uh, Dunketia without having sought an update on those eight persons who were killed. I mean, this is a no-brainer. To be honest with you, when I look at it, for that particular, the way they've not shown any uh, enthusiasm at, you know, bringing pressure to bear on the duty bearers to go on, move on with those eight cases that's involving citizens that were killed. For that, you know, I just also feel that, matter of fact, this peace council is really not necessary, to be very honest with you. Because you see, this is the thing. You are going into a meeting. As part, and you are going to meet a stalwart like Isi Ibukitia. You don't know the person you are going to meet. You should know that by all means, the electoral violence in the last cycle will be number one on the agenda. You went unprepared. You had no answers for him. And to be honest with you, look, I think that I strongly buy into this thing that the Peace Council should just be disbanded. They are useless. Useless. They can't anticipate. You have to anticipate the opponent, anticipate the person you are going to negotiate with. And the death of these eight persons is something that we should never let go of until we get justice for those people. Because they will never be peace. 
unless we get justice. So for justice for those eight people, it is not negotiable. So if the Peace Council wants to have any credibility at all, then they should get on with it. Talk to IGP, talk to the Attorney General, ask for an update on all the eight cases and see what can be done. Last year, uh, 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 Star Ghana, right, organized a lecture. Dr. Mohammed Ibn Chambers, uh, the former foreign uh, minister, then um, uh, UN undersecretary for the Sahel region, etc. He delivered a speech on it. You know, it was quite a moving speech at the British Council. It's just been about a year, right? Sam Seladi Anyanini was the moderator for the occasion. You think these eight people, we are going to let that matter die? No. So I dove my heart off to Esiedun Ketia. So he has something to say. And I like the way uh, Hamid has also accepted that, yes, Esiedun Ketia has some legitimate concerns. So those ones that are very legitimate, let the Peace Council go back, see what can be done. We still have a, some time to the election, right? We still have the whole of September, October, and November. Yeah, it's not that peace pact that's going to bring us peace per se. It's just a symbolic uh, this gesture, right? So they have some time. No rush about it. They should go to the IGP, go to Attorney General, and seek a brief, detailed brief on each of the cases. Look, if they need help, they can invite some of us. We can come and help them. Then we'll see what can be done between now and the elections. A lot can be done. A lot. So you can't just come and say, oh, the Peace Council needs help. The Peace Council needs help. No. Call the IGP. Call Attorney General. Invite lawyers who want to do pro bono. who will come in because, you see, if P they, as far as I'm aware, the chairman of the Peace Council uh, is a lay, but he's not a lawyer. Okay, so when I say lay, I'm not being disrespectful, okay, at all. So you need lawyers. And maybe Peace Council, I, I'm not aware of their lawyer. If, uh, and, you know, things like this, you need uh, a bit of crowd wisdom. Even if there are one or two lawyers, they could do with more lawyers who would want to come on board, go into those meetings with IG and a, Attorney General. I hope it's not this Attorney General who is shown that he's quite crooked. I mean, the tape saga involving Chakpa and the rest, not this Attorney General. I hope with a new Attorney General. Then we can sit down and help go into these matters and see what we can do. I'm telling you that three months is a lot of time. It's a lot of time to be able to move these cases forward so that there will be confidence in the system. Don't just come and force people to sign peace pacts when the government, and like Sam George said, the president hasn't shown any concern. He's disrespected us all these years. When Sam George is saying it, people are just interested in his uh, things like in Africa, older persons are right. I think that's just what I'm hearing. I mean, though it's not being said directly. Away with those things. That's how we've sat down for old men, our grandparents to run this country down. It's time. Listen, if you enter the political free, it means that you want to save. And so if you want to save and you are getting it wrong, toddlers can tell you that it is wrong. Don't worry about the language. If the president had done a good job about following up on these eight persons who lost their lives, could Sam George have described him in such terms, uh, his comments in such terms? You remember Joe Weiss. Joe Weiss said those people who died were criminals, something to that effect. And to date, he hasn't apologized for it. There will never be peace if there's no justice. Let's seek justice first. But we are also very clear in our mind that it is not the peace pact that is going to guarantee peace. No, it is not that peace pact. It is the very conduct of the president, is the way he has given sucker, sucker to Brian e. Champo to continue to spew that nonsense. Well, so, that, Council, the, the point is that it's not so much about what was said. When I dwelt on that, it wasn't necessarily because of the reference you make about respect for old men and so on. I think I was very clear in the position that I took concerning the statement Sam George made. And he continuously clarified exactly what he meant by that and made it clear that he was not insulting the president. I needed yeah. that to be clear because, yeah, and, 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 and yes, and, and so I, it's, I just wanted to make it clear that it is not about uh, yeah, any I'm way. not saying it, 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 it against you. Uh, okay. Right. And what uh -huh. I'm bringing up is that, uh, Behind that conversation, what has not been said 
is that, hey, in Africa, the older people are always right. We've thrown out that root. It hasn't served us. If the older, you think it's every older person who is wise, yeah, don't you know that even fools grow old? Don't fools okay. grow old? A child right. who is foolish grows up into a foolish adult and grows into a foolish old person. So it's not every adult who is wise. Okay. So let's go with the merits of the arguments and stop this age thing, just because you are older and give respect to the older. But this is politics. We are not talking about but, domestics. Maybe in the house yeah, when you it. have paid, you have paid all the bills, then that one you deserve some respect because you have paid all the bills. But in this politics here, they are serving us. The money we use in building the roads, etc. they are not the president's personal funds. In actual fact, he has rather come to benefit. His family has come to enrich themselves at our expense. So that thing that maybe the respect you give your father in the house because he has fed you doesn't apply in politics because in politics, you've come to serve. So you don't know it all. So the citizens will tell you what is wrong. And even as I've said, to make matters worse in politics, these guys have come to enrich themselves. So please, let's know where we can say, oh, the older one is right. He's right when he has paid the piper. You see, he who pays the piper calls it true. But the president doesn't pay the piper. He is a servant, and he has enriched himself, he and his family, through corruption at our expense. So we can't let that rule that he's older. So because just because of that, we should just let him do anything. Things that are, uh, that's a, what do you call it, unsimilated. Things that are unbecoming. Things that don't move the uh, governance of this country forward. And you have indicated that, that you government. were, yes, you are going to take up some issues that you have put out on this platform, that you're going to lead a prosecution of the president if he get, goes out of power. I just want you to be reminded of that, that I'm holding you by your word, that all of these yes, allegations and... of corruption, you are going to court on it. Excellent. To, Good. Mr. To... Kansi, let me quickly chip in. Tell me, I told you, listen, I walk the talk I know. as we speak that, now. That's, that's why I continuously remind you of it, so that it's not just about yes, you making let allegations. Me give you, let me give you breaking news. Let me give you breaking news. We've sued SML. Eh? I've mm -hmm. led ASAP, CDG Ghana, uh, many other uh, NGOs. We've sued the uh, uh, this, um, SML and Keno Furiata for the recovery of that billions of uh, CDs that have been paid to them. We've sued in the high court. So Furiata will be saved. He should come and show the breaches of the law, the way he breached the law to let SML get those contracts. He will come to court to testify. Then he will see. Uh, well, if he wants to throw in the towel and not, and not come and defend this action, fine. But we are in court against SML. So you find ASEP, uh, CDD Ghana, there are six other uh, media foundation for West Africa, that's the man of Brian, okay? Uh, GII, Ghana Anti-Corruption uh, Initiative. And then uh, which one? Yeah, there are seven uh, plaintiffs. And more, Imani and co are joining. So the SML matter, it's in court. I told you, the yes. timing is very important. We'll sue at a time when this government is going out of power so that there won't be any chances that uh, they will go and, like, Godfrey Dami goes to see judges uh, privately so that there will be no chance that he can go and do any such thing. Right. Uh -huh. That is okay. it. No, but, well, thank you for this information. because I keep asking you this because, then again, it's not just you saying that the president or this government is corrupt and not go beyond this statement and prove mm -hmm. beyond reasonable doubt that indeed there is some corruption going on by going to court, which you have just indicated to me that you have taken the mm -hmm. first step on one of many cases that you intend to take to court. So thank you for no, that No, this is number two. No. This is number two. We've okay. already sued on the Cecilia Dapa matter. Myself right. and Professor Jampo. Prof We've Great. sued for the Cecilia Dapa matter and then now SML. So two. Great. There will be more. In fact, we'll be following up on, on that and, and more. Th thank you for this information, Council. And um, sure. stay. That leads us to our next issue, the matters of corruption and suspected corruption. In fact, this, this week, the Public Accounts Committee was in the news. And the person who asked the question of the sports minister, in fact, Public Accounts Committee has been doing quite a number of things. So many things have been happening there. And... <laughs> There are many who have been asked about, they've been given more powers to be able to just, beyond televising this, these acts of corruption and they expressing frustrations about it, 
something more must be done because we're losing so much money, which is revealed on television. Then to what end? Let's start off with the sports ministry because there's one other GES officer who also appeared before the committee. Some 15,000 CDs was paid into his account mistakenly and he said it, he thought what it was a blessing or so and, and, and that he's going to pay back the money. He has some 18,000 CDs investment and so on. Before that, can we just have that education minister, the GES officer, who appear before the Public Accounts Committee, hmm? that GES officer. The All-Africa Games, right? Can you share with this committee how much that coverage was, was for and whether payment has been made for Singh? Thank you so much. Yes, uh, GBC was the official broadcaster for the African Games, the 13th African Games, and I can confirm that full payment have made made to gbc do you do, can you do you do you have per chance what the amount was i don't i can't recollect the exact amount but i know that it's in the excess of three million us us dollars you paid gbc yes in excess of three million us dollars yes. Yes. for coverage of the all africa games yes. Chairman, I think that I would rest here and maybe the next time GBC appears before us because most of the technicians who worked on the All-Africa Games have still not been paid. And so we wanted to ascertain if you have paid and how much has been paid. Chairman, I'm grateful. So that's what will happen with the uh, sports minister. There's a public account committee, te the teacher, the teacher, the teacher who also uh, appeared before the committee this week. The Public Accounts Committee, that, that teacher who also um, uh, indicated some 15,000 CDs was paid wrongfully into his account. The Public Accounts Committee had some issues about that. Let's he hear from that and we'll go into the sports ministry matter. was more than the amount you are expecting. Did you know at that time when you received the salary? No, please. When I got the money, I thought it was my money until the auditors came in. But and uh, like like we say in local uh, local um, settings, you have chopped the money. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Samson. Yes, please. You've chopped the money. Yes, boss. I see. <laughs> All right. So we are grateful for your sincerity. Um, you agreed to pay 500 cities a month. Yes, please. Um, at a point, you stopped in paying. Uh, what, 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 what is the challenge with that? In Once fact, you have agreed to pay. In fact, I started paying. And after I paid two months, I had a problem. So I, could, I couldn't continue anymore. So I, I went to the office and then discussed it with the director. And I promised that I'm having an investment, uh, which will end ending of this month. So if the money comes, I'll try if I can pay everything off, or if I can, I'll pay part of it. How much is your investment? Um, okay, the investment uh, is supposed to be 18,000. Well, um, yes, 18,000, you are able to cover the remaining amount, but probably maybe investments are meant for, um, we, we will not stretch you that much, take your time, um, and please pay the money. We, we want you to pay the money, but okay. don't break the bank okay. in paying the money. Okay. Um, yes, so please, if by end of month you have all the money and you think you can pay, kindly... I see. So that's uh, the Public Accounts Committee hearing with this gentleman who has been described as a GES officer. 
he received 15,000 CDs payment into his account wrongly. And, and Mr. George, you, you are a member of the committee. I want to understand that last statement that um, one of your members made about, you know, this gentleman, not, yes, he has to pay back. You have given him a payment plan. When he has an investment of 18,000 CDs, which you can ask him to pay off immediately because he has admitted that the money was received wrongly. What's, what's the work of the Public Accounts Committee? Because in the end, after exposing all of this, then what? Thank you, Alfred. The Public Accounts Committee is one of uh, the standing committees of Parliament. And um, we do quite some work. Basically, we review the work of an officer of Parliament. That's the Auditor General. The Auditor General is an officer of Parliament. He does his report, submits it to Parliament. Mr. Speaker refers it to the PAC. We sit on it, um, meet those who have infractions, and then do our reports to plenary. Now, I think on the back of, I don't know if it's Martin who went to court, or if it was Franklin, um, there's now the ruling of, on surcharge. No, I think it was Occupy Ghana. Occupy Ghana that did that case. So now um, we refer you for prosecution by the, the Attorney General. It appears that our Attorney General is more busy meeting judges than doing, handling those prosecutions. So we don't see those prosecutions happen. But um, basically, we do what we have to do. Our, we don't have prosecutorial powers. And so I remember that in the last parliament, um, there was a gentleman who had appeared previously before us, earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. He had given us a setting like he was an auctioneer. He, what we realized was he was cooking the auctions and buying the state properties he was auctioning lowering the, the rates and all of that. And when he came again to appear before us on another infraction, he lied about it. It was clear he was lying. And Abeji immediately asked that the parliament... Parliament has a police unit. Yes. Uh, the parliamentary police unit should immediately arrest him, detain him, arrest him, and charge him for perjury. In fact, we have that video. And... and, and this was and, in 2020, right? Yes, 2020. And mm -hmm. at that time, the current majority leader, Afenyo Markin, was a member of the committee. Afenyo took the chairman of the committee on seriously um, and said that the committee had no such powers because we are different from the Ugandan Public Accounts Committee. Afenyo may have been right because we don't have the powers of prosecution. In fact, criminal prosecution in Ghana resides only with the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And so we can only make references, referrals. We've made those referrals. The Attorney General, like I said, uh, is preoccupied with other things and is not focused on this prosecution because quite a number of referrals have been made to him. But when, in this particular instance, mm -hmm. um, when the deputy ranking member, uh, OPK, made those comments, the chairman stepped in. If you played that video in this full, yeah. you realize that the yeah. chairman stepped in and the chairman insisted that the payments must be made from that 18,000 investment. Because, mm. But you see, what we realized is that there's a cartel going on. In yeah. one of the instances I handled, I think that was in Golu or so, someone had left office for 20 months or had not been reporting to work as a teacher for 20 months. Meanwhile, the person was validated every one of the 20 months and was being, being paid. paid. You cannot tell me one month, two months, I can take it that, okay, the person thought maybe this person will come back, the person had some issues, but 20 months. 20 months, they keep validating the person. Clearly, there was an instance. In fact, in one of the other instances, the committee discovered mm -hmm. <laughs> Ghana. The person had left to the U.S. He had DAPA to the U.S. for two years. But you know the validation the, the, in the system, in the GES system, they have people who are validators. And the validators have a code that they use to do the validation. Mm -hmm. He was a validator for his circuit. He left the country with a code and kept validating himself for two years from the U.S. And wow. the payments were being made. And every time he hit an account, another head teacher who was still in the service was withdrawing the money. So you could see that some sort of cartel. Mm. We've, we've referred all of this to the Attorney General. Like I said, we can prosecute. It's up to the Attorney General to prosecute. So that particular, that, that's the, that, that's yeah, yes, that and, and I want us to look at what happened in 2020 when the, the chair of Public Accounts Committee, James Kutia Veji, ordered the arrest of one person who appeared before yeah. you. That was an outlier for me because we've not. Yeah, but we we're, we're, we're called this. out. Well, the committee was called out. And so, that so in this, in this in instance, let's, of let, our yes, let's look at that video. Let's take a look at that. You come and deceive this committee to take anything. No, Mr. Chairman. Get away with it. No, Mr. Chairman, not like that. We are going to lock you. you have that. No, we are going to lock you. We have, we have, 
the police will take a statement from you, and that statement will be used against you. And the local, we will not prosecute you, but the, 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 the government will take over. So uh, do we have the Ghana Police Service Parliament House already? Yes, Can you take the two officers to yes, the station? Well, so that's what happened. Then, then, the Public Account Committee Chair ordered the arrest of this person. The police moved in and put handcuffs on them. Yeah, uh, like I said, uh, we, we, several lawyers So can't you do all out. of this? Well, well I, I, I would have wished that we had the power to do that. We reviewed our standing orders, but still, you, we, we cannot assign and ascribe to ourselves the power for prosecution. The constitution is clear. So this was just one, a one-off situation. Yeah, this was a, a, and this was a, a, a position that the committee had met in conclave and decided, let's explore this. Because we're getting a lot of backlash that we're just a talk shop. You work, mm -hmm. you do your reports, you expose a rot, nothing happens. But once we took this step, there was all kinds of legal pushback. And, and we've had to go back to what the status quo is, refer them to the Attorney General for prosecution, and now we need to have the Attorney General prosecute these instances. I, I don't know if you want us to go into the GFA. Let's go, go straight the to Minister the, the sports, sports matter. Now, yes. well, after that, that question and the answer that you got from the sports minister, the GBC Director General also spoke on, on Unique, as one of the radio stations of GBC, and so essentially making the point about the fact that the GBC received only $105,000 out of the $3.6 million thereabout that was paid. Now, we have the GBC Director General's letter, which um, we'll put on the screen right now. Um, it says, it is important to clarify that GBC was the official broadcaster, but not responsible for the technical production of the games. The technical production was outsourced as GBC did not have the equipment to produce the games. Also, the following organizations were responsible for the technical production. PGS, Quality Media Productions, SL. The Production Room, TPR. Then the Sports Ministry, Sports Ministry eventually also issued a statement. And we have excerpts of the Ministry of Youth and Sports statement essentially making the point that they, as host of the 13th African Games, appointed GBC as the host of the broadcast that we put on the screen right now. Under the arrangement, GBC would, was expected to provide one dedicated 24-hour channel for the broadcast of the 13th Africa Games. And GBC shall provide all services, personnel, and equipment needed for the following. Broadcast Management International Broadcast Center, production of games from all venues, and montages, bumpers, signal distribution. Also, the following services and technical features were included. The live recording and broadcast of the opening and closing ceremonies, seven to 10 hours of a daily super feed for live broadcasts and playback, satellite space segment and turnaround, editorial management crew, a, a one hour daily Africa games run up game program, and also, the fees. It is agreed that GBC would provide services in the amount of $3.6 million. That the Ministry of Youth and Sports is solely responsible for the payment of the service provided. That the Ministry of Youth and Sports would transfer the CD equivalent of the cash to the GBC for payment. And GBC says 105000 is what they received, plus 100 CDs that they were paying the crew from GBC who the cameramen and others, 100 CDs a day. My colleague cameramen here are not happy hearing this, and that is legitimate. But, but then, Mr. George, after this response and the ensuing statement that have been issued by both GBC and the Ministry of Youth and Sports, does it bring clarity to the matter? Does it settle the matter for you? Well, absolutely not. In fact, there, there have been more revelations since with all the exposés because everybody's mm -hmm. trying to clean and, and extricate themselves from the mess. True. Um, but it's like being in sinking sand. The more you pull, the deeper you sink. 
when I asked that question, it's because I'd received complaints from GBC that some from their technical staff, some of them had not even been paid. And some of them had been paid just 100 Ghana CDs. So when I asked the minister, he says, oh, we've paid in excess of $3 million. Immediately, the ripple effect starts in GBC. People are saying, hey, more than $3 million has come and we've got 100 Ghana CDs. So the next morning, Professor Alassane goes on TV to say that we only received 105,000. Then he writes officially to the Public Accounts Committee and copies me because he says, I asked the question. Now, in that letter, he says that he is surprised that the minister is making allusions that over three million was paid to GBC. I mean, that was diplomatic language for saying the minister lied. Because mm. if, if, if a minister sits on national TV under oath to say, I paid in excess of three million to an institution, and the head of that institution comes and says, well, I'm surprised the minister is saying this. It means that what the minister is saying is not true. But in their letter, they said, the minister said they were going to pay a city equivalent to, to GBC. Oh, well, I'm building the case. Mm -hmm. You let me build it so you follow. Indeed. So once he does that, he goes ahead to say that they only benefited 105. That's the word he used, benefited, $105,000. And then proceeds to list three companies as having been used as subcontractors. Now, it would then suggest that those three companies and 97% of the contract. And GBC, which was the one that put in the bid, and only 3%. From the get-go, that lets you know that GBC was simply a front for something that was happening. Now, further digging has shown that Professor Lassan was not honest in his, in his letter to Parliament, to Public Accounts and to me. The GBC Director. The GBC Director General. Because the Ministry has now put out a letter from Professor Lassan where Professor Lassan wrote to the ministry mm -hmm. requesting payments to subcontractors. And in that, if you take GBC out, there were five, not three. But in his mm. letter to parliament, he stated only three. Yes. He, he, he marked two mm. entities that were paid. Why he chose to do that, he has to answer to the Ghanaian people. Because mm. you are providing parliament, a house of records, with information on who the subcontractors are. You had five other contractors. Per the letter you wrote to the ministry, a copy of which we, we the ministry has put out that we've seen, you requested for payment to six different entities. I see. Now, so it's not just PGS, quality media. No, it's not media, just PGS, quality media, production and, room. And, and the production room. Silicon Productions. You requested that they should pay them $165,000. You also requested that positive communications should be paid $20,000. Hmm. Now, when we started doing further digging into this matter, it turns out that, because when you look at the, the, the document, PGS got the chunk of the money, almost 2.1 million euros. Hmm. So I started asking, what does PGS do? Look, <laughs> PGS was paid almost 2.1 million euros to sit in Spain and do what they called offside production. Off-site production. Not one person from PGS came to Boteman or Legon Sports Stadium. GBC cameramen manned the camera, manned the equipment. Then they gave feed through a satellite uplink. And those guys sat in Spain to do offline production. And they charged 2.1 million euros. That, that will be almost $2.5 million. Are you saying to me that we don't have the capacity in Ghana to do that production that was done by PGS? Who is the one who negotiated with PGS? And you see, the question we must be asking ourselves, Alassane says, Professor Alassane says that he's unaware of the money. Meanwhile, he wrote to the minister, and the minister made payment of $1 million to GBC on the 15th of March. On the 22nd of May, he made another payment of $1.5 million. Then subsequent to that, Alassane wrote and said, pay $1 million directly to a company. So why would he write in his letter to parliament that he's unaware of the money? Why would he go and stand on GBC's platform and say they only received their, their bank trails and only $105,000 came in?
That's, that's, that's not factual. Now, mm. what even shocks me is why the ministry in the first place paid 3.6 million to GBC. What, 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 why, why does that shock you or concern you? <laughs> Sporting events, mm -hmm. broadcast rights are big money. The Premier League that we all watch, when they are selling their rights for broadcast, they sell them in like four or five year slots. They run into billions of dollars. And that's why at the point in time, for those who remember, in Ghana, DSTV did not have Premier League. It was some other uh, network that came for some one year B. Yeah, with the orange, orange yeah. thing, because they had bought the rights, because they bid more. And then eventually the money they paid for it, it, it ended up collapsing. I, I can't remember the name of, of that company. Yeah, it's um, I think good. They had this gene. Yes, it yeah. starts with G. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Now let's ask ourselves why is it that the All African Games were broadcast in at least 40 African countries on 40 national TV stations? GBC provided live super feed, the super live feed, to all of these places. We did it for free. We gave out that content for free. The Cup of African, the African Cup of Nations, mm -hmm. the broadcast rights are sold in hundreds or tens of millions of dollars. I think it's a gateway. Gateway, that's what it is. Yes, talking. gateway. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm. So the question you ask yourself is, why is the government of Ghana, who should be selling and making money, from hosting the All African Games, selling the rights, rather be paying somebody to do the broadcast. Do, do, do you get the question? Instead of asking? earning money. Instead of earning money, we have now put in money into companies that we don't know really who is fronting for those companies. That's one. Now, the GBC tells us that they did this outsourcing because they lack capacity. Yes, That's what Professor Lassan yes, They didn't have the technical capacity. How to... many places did, how many, how many sites did the All Africa Games happen from? Two. Yes. Boteman and Legon. Only two sites. Mm -hmm. This same GBC, that says that they don't have capacity. There, or there, were, there, there was three, 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 three there sites. There was three sites. There was uh, Cape Coast. Oh, Cape Coast as well. Yes, there was football, then, after, I think, then, in Cape Coast. Cape Coast. So Cape Coast, Boteman, and, then and, and, Legon. and Legon. Yes. So two, two in Accra. So, there's some that took place at the conference center. Yeah. So Some four centers. Areas. Yes. So say. three of those centers in Accra and one in Cape Coast. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, <laughs> the same GBC had sent a proposal to the Ghana Football Association, GFA, asking for sole broadcast rights for the Ghana Premier League. Mm -hmm. And GBC was offering the GFA $5.5 million. $5.5 million? To get the sole broadcast rights to the Ghana Premier League. Over a period of years, mm -hmm. 5.5 million. The GBC claims that it had the capacity to broadcast live and on every weekend, at least we have games in about eight or nine centers yes. across the country. The GBC, could, because I think there are 18 teams in the league. Mm -hmm. There are 18, te 18 teams in the league, right? Mm -hmm. If there are 18 teams in the league, that's nine games. Nine games every weekend, literally. And the GBC says that they had the capacity to, to produce for the Premier League and air, and they wanted the sole rights. Meanwhile, they don't have the capacity to produce all Africa games. They were willing to pay 5.5 million, but now they have taken our 3.5, 3.6 million. In fact, the minister again has to answer for an outstanding 100,000, because when you look at the minister's letter, he says he paid 1.5 million on the 15th of March. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the 22nd of May, 1.5 million. Then he transferred another 1 million. If you add that, 3.5 million. The contract said 3.6 million. Yes. So we have change of $100,000. He has to let us know where that is. Mm. But this whole thing is just getting murkier. Because you're mm. asking yourself, you say you can produce Premier League. Now, but you know what even kills me the most? And everybody who has DSTV or GoTV will remember that the All Africa Games was on DSTV and Go TV. GTV, or Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, gave the feed to Super Sports for free. That's what they are telling us. Ah. And Super Sports aired it in the over 30 countries that they are in, in Africa, and collected money. Let's clap for the GBC. Ah. And Professor ah. They gave the feed for free to Super Sports.
for Super Sports to air across Africa. So, per your record, Super Sports didn't pay any money to GPC. As far as I'm aware, no. And I'm challenging from Samuel and Hassan to come and show us, tell us how much he earned from giving the fee to Super Sports and show us the receipts of the payment. Because I've checked, there was no money that went to GBC. Yet, Super Sports got that fee for free. And Super Sports charged the viewers because it was not on a free channel on, Super, on DSTV, it was on a paid channel. So that's what I'm saying. This thing, it, we've used our state money to produce and give to private people to make money. It's the same way we've just found out, again, from these games. And that one, the minister has to answer. $15 million was used to feed athletes for 18 days. I just... Meaning that hmm. every day we spent 10 million Ghana cities on food. $15 million Jesus Christ. was spent on food or feeding the athletes, $15 million. Yes. Alfred, look, we are getting to a place where the thing is no longer, it's no longer making sense. So. It's no longer making sense. So every day, 10 million, why? The food they cook, they use the blood of Jesus to, do the, the, to cook the food. Was the blood of Jesus the, 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 the seasoning that they used to cook the food for the athletes in the, in, at the All Africa Games? 10 million Ghana cities. How many school buildings would that build in your constituency and my constituency? Every day. And I don't want to say anything because I still don't have evidence of it. But okay. we are hearing the name of the contractor. Okay, so don't, since you don't have evidence, don't put it out. Hey, Yehova, my and, heart. And don't, don't put it out because I've also heard the name. Let's hmm. not put it out there as yet because we're also doing our own checks on it. But, Dr. Ama, this is an area where... I, mean, I need education, to drink because yeah, my yeah. BP... You drink the water. An, an, an area where education is linked to sports, and you, you have the passion for it, even before you got into to politics. That's where I know you from. And hearing all of this and how things have played out, and even before the Public Accounts Committee for that matter, and to the extent that now we are still asking for answers to questions about where and how our money was spent. That's concerning, to say the least, is it not? Alfred, I think that the, the contest that you set in respect of this particular discussion was the expenditure on the All African Games. Indeed. And the testimony of the sports, uh, the minister. sports minister. Yes. Um, together with the response from the Director General. That's right. There has been so much extrapolations and huge allegations that are unsubstantiated. Can you please I think point one out of, some of the them? things you need to do is that when people are not here and their names are bastardized on your platform, you afford them the opportunity to clarify matters. Especially, can you outline the, the specific the, allegation that was the made? The Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation's name has been mentioned. Yes. And I mean, you heard the, the things that my colleague here said about it. Yes. And in a manner that impugned on his integrity. I am saying this no. because, okay. I mean, this is my first time of being on this platform. No, I wanted you to and, spend, like, state and, specifically, and this, uh, respectfully. You've, you've, yes. You've, mm -hmm. you've, you listened to the, his submission. Right. And I'm sure you heard, and some of them, you were, you were even surprised. No, no. I'm saying that when people's no. names are mentioned no, no, in no, a no. manner that impugned because you see, no, you, see you, you, you can no, lose i'll give you your time to speak but i wanted you to specifically state which allegation that was made and then the the integrity of the director general impugned because mm, there were specific so, so. statements that were made if it was go going to the extent of impugning his integrity i would draw some judges attention to it because he made reference to statements that were issued by the GBC, signed by the Director General himself, and the interviews he had granted. And then also the letters that the GBC Director himself has written to the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament. So where exactly is the, the statement? What statement exactly are you talking I'm about? I'm saying that allegations have been made against, against him. That, Which allegations? That, that um, um, DSTV, um, uh, multi-choice also, multi-choice, Broadcast some of the um, the sporting is, activities, yes. you know, free of charge. So I asked the question. Free of charge. Is there any evidence to that effect? Oh, that's I why know. I asked the question whether the, the GBC Director General had stated that. And he said, 
it. I'm just and, indicated that I, they haven't made any indication of payment being made to and, them. And, and I expected that some of the issues here, you could have called the, 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 the director general to respond to it, you know, because if you do that, it makes it very difficult for some of us who don't have the full information, you know, to, to, to respond in a manner that will safeguard the image of, of, of the person's name, whose names have been, have been mentioned. You see, there, there was a question that was asked at the Public Account Committee. It was in relation to the expenditure on GBC. Yeah. The minister was very clear and certain. He said that he had made $3.6 million payment to GBC. Mm -hmm. GBC Director General responds. Response. And then when he responds, he says that they received 105,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, the further evidence has shown that the uh, contract was signed between Ghana Broadcasting Corporation and the Ministry of, Work, uh, Ministry of Youth and Sports uh, in respect of broadcast for the All Africa Games. Right. GBC indicates that one month prior to the time when they were consulted, they did not have the capacity to undertake that assignment. And as a result of that, outsource some of the activities to third parties. Yes. They, monies allocated to them was $105,000. Right. All the remaining amounts of monies were in respect of services of the other third parties. It's as simple as that. The statement from the Director General was specific to how much they received. I think that he could have gone further by explaining that indeed GBC per the contract received $105,000. However, they outsourced the other activities to third party. That would have clarified the matter. But just ending at what they received, mm -hmm. you know, made the, 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 the contest a bit difficult to appreciate because then you begin to, uh, to think that something untoward had, had happened. The, the matter is clarified now. Matter is the, clarified. The matter is clarified from now. From where you say? Uh, from where I say it, that the contract that was signed between Ghana Broadcasting and Corporation and the Ministry of uh, Youth and Sports was 3.6 million. GBC outsourced uh, part of the contract to eight, third parties, and these third parties were paid through GBC. And that there is no evidence that any money has been misappropriated or misallocated. So that's that's that settles the matter. Are you concerned? Are you not concerned as well about, for instance, monies that were paid to some third parties, as some judge had indicated, 2.2 million euros? Do you, have the, you the seen the details of, of exactly? Have you, have you seen the, a copy of the contract between the third parties? Yes. Have you seen? You see, it, this should, is the, should it, should this it is not the, be of so, concern so to you, you see, in asking that question? If you don't that have details. contrary evidence, you don't falsify what is existing. <laughs> if you don't have it, you have not seen the contract, the nitty gritties of that particular service. Mm. Then, if you, if you, you may want to conjecture and no. think that they sat somewhere and provided the services. But you need to understand the okay. terms of the contract Perfect. to be able to see whether or not there's value for money. Would you if want, you to, don't would have you want that, that to be made available? If you don't, you don't have that, it's difficult for you to, 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 to make those assertions. And that's where my problem is. If you do that, if you go along that pathway, it becomes clear that we want to politicize almost everything. Parliaments, by the architecture of parliament, our responsibility is to play over oversight role right. on the expenditure that we approve. In fact, the whole idea of parliament or representation is taxation. When you tax people and you take people's money, you have to be able to account for the money. And there must be representation of the people to go and ensure that their monies are collected, the monies that are collected appropriately and efficiently used. So the mm -hmm. responsibility of parliament to play that oversight responsibility, yes. uh, oversight role, is not in that. And mm -hmm. public account committee is one of the, the, the committees under Article 103 to ensure that uh, um, the, the monies that are approved by parliament from the consolidated funds are used 
properly. Mm. And that's, well, that's the mandate, and that's what they have been doing. And what they do is to also foster accountability in the system. But if we go, be, go beyond that and then begin to politicize almost everything, you know, it makes it very difficult you know, for people to appreciate the, 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 the genuineness you know, and, and, and truthfulness in some of the, 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 the submissions that we make. And that's where I have a problem. If you put me in this situation, it's quite difficult for me to fit in. Okay. Because I would have want to have opportunity to see the specific contract with those third parties. Mm. And then if we want to further examine them, and see whether there's any value for money, we'll do that. But Absolutely. you don't have that, and you just and, and in fact, that's why I was asking for specifics, because in the end, the questions are being asked on this platform, Dr. Ama, that how come such amount of money was paid to a third party who was outside of the jurisdiction? And I think that you made a point about Parliament's oversight role in ensuring and executing your role, your oversight role of our public funds and the judicious use of the meager resources that we have. I believe that these are some of the fundamental questions you, be, you should also be asking so that it would then solicit the details that you need about this contract. Because if you don't ask these questions, obviously, then these things will just go away without any form of accountability. So, I just want to know if that, that was a problem. No I, think, no, I think that is very fair okay. to, 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 to inquire into the nitty gritties of their contract. Okay. It's very fair, and there are rules, um, I mean, there are, there are statutory uh, provisions that enables, or framework that enables people to inquire. We've got the uh, right to information, you know, that allows us to get any information that we want. And I'm saying that. If you not, had a not copy, all the information we oh, well, I mean, relevant, and this is not something that is confidential. If you want okay. to get uh, information regarding to this, regarding this particular matter, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is that unless you have evidence, documentary evidence, of the content and structure of the contract, it's quite difficult to place value judgment on the propriety of the, the, the amount expended in respect of that particular contract. And that's where my, 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 my issue is. And I say, I'm saying that we have to be very cautious in, 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 in matters of, of this nature and making assertions that suggest that somebody has done something onto us without any basis. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. so th this is a matter that you also follow quite closely. In fact, uh, we had a prior conversation ahead of today and this, the fundamental issue is the question about where and how the monies were used or expended and the accountability for those and whether they were actually used judiciously. There's $3.6 million. And the detail we are hearing from some George this morning now. Alfred, <clears throat> democracy is good. Yes, indeed. Democracy is very, very good. Because, you see, the only way Democracy can be bad is if you remain stagnant and you sit still. Yes. Democracy provides that. The form of democracy we've given ourselves with the Constitution provides that Parliament shall question the use of public funds through the Public Accounts Committee. Now, this committee was sitting there being introduced because uh, uh, their proceedings were getting nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then, as a country, we decided to televise the proceedings in order to put fear it's the people. Now, we televised without further action beyond telev uh, television. So again, uh, people were getting blasé. They would come and sit there, say whatever they like, and get away with it, because there was no follow-up. Because the attorney general may not be doing the things uh, he or she is supposed to do at any point in time. But I'm saying it's good because it enables sunshine exposure. Mm -hmm. So the committee says down, George, uh, uh, Honorable uh, 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 Sam. Sam George asked a question about the media component because he probably is on the communications committee, so he knows. Mm -hmm. But, my brother, I, I pass through Legon campus virtually every other day, and I'm asking questions about the air conditioners that are hanging in the games village. Doing what? $16 million to provide accommodation. 
We didn't build a new structure. We went and installed air conditioners in existing structures, and we end up disconnecting the air conditioners after the games, and the air conditioning units are hanging there. For what? How do you account for that $16 million? The entire African games has to be investigated. The enormous amounts that have been committed to public procurement, opaque public procurements made in the dark, public procurements that need to be questioned very deeply, because I'm sure most of them were done on sole sourcing basis. The abuse of sole sourcing in this country, 3.6 million is the least of what has gone into this uh, 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 situation. Really? It's, um, I am asking about the 16 million that went into the accommodation. Mm. So, who were the contractors? What, why was the decision made to install air conditioners in buildings that were already existing? If they didn't intend to continue using the air conditioners afterwards, how are they going to now deal with the air conditioner problem? The, the, the renovations that were made, we have been told, are $16 million. How are they now going to sustain the, the, that money that has been committed? Mm -hmm. Are they going to take those units out and sell them as scrap or, or to be used by other uh, entities? Or uh, what was the end game? What was the plan? When $16 million was being invested in existing structures, can they tell us why they didn't invest $16 million in a brand new structure. structure, which could have then been leased out afterwards or run as a hostel to recover that $16 million to the state? Did they just decide that we can spend $16 million anyhow and get away with it? Because you are getting away with it, and the way you are getting away with it is that you have actually destroyed the integrity of the structures that are there. You've dug holes in the walls and installed air conditioning, which you have now disconnected. Of what use is it to the people of Ghana? How much have we spent so far? You are talking in excess of <laughs> nearly $300 million dollars on the all african games it, it, it's public games it, mm -hmm. it's for the continent and and a hosting nation invests in it you invest in facilities you invest in the entertainment of the people who come you invest in uh, their comfort in order for them to put on a good show for the people granted but once it's public money you invest with post accountability in mind you invest that after all the enjoyment mm -hmm. you will come and justify the monies that were spent on it. And that is the process where I'm saying democracy is good. Because through this question to the Public Accounts Committee, the door is now open for Ghana to question all the other expenditures hmm. that have been made. Mm. My particular concern is about the expenditures on the accommodation. Because up but, to now, I don't understand why they didn't put up a building. From the $16 when, million. Dollars. But that's what we've been told. Unless I'm wrong, that $16 million was spent on, on, on the games village. And that games village is existing buildings. So hostels are the investor of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, you know, they modify. So Thank far. you. How did they modify them? By installing air conditioners, which they have not disconnected. By installing air conditioners, which they have not disconnected. The air conditioners are not available for the use of the students who sleep in those rooms. And the students are still paying for the hostel facilities, for the use of those facilities. So those uh, uh, people who came there for three weeks, use the air conditioners for $16 million for three weeks use of air conditioners. Mm. So now what are you going to do with the units that are, are hanging on the walls? So, 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 so let us be clear. The abuse of public procurement has gone on for far too long. Mm. And later on when we talk about the, the, the manifestos, the Great Transformational Plan, Alan Shematis says he's going to cancel public procurement so source entirely because it is a major source of pro, uh, uh, corruption in this country. Uh, you go into the All Africa Games. Now you are talking about names for food that you don't want to mention. <laughs> Inevitably, mm -hmm. if you've we'll heard the names, names. <laughs> if you've heard the names, it, it may be right. <laughs> because what happens in this country is that people with access to the facts may not speak for themselves, mm -hmm. but will come out and pass them through channels which they believe are credible. So if somebody is passed a name to you, then the person may be present at the point where the contract was being made or at the point where the monies were being dispersed or received. And, and the person may feel that they don't have enough or of an interest in something that they've participated in and therefore they must expose it. Mm -hmm. so, so the question, if people have received sole sourcing contracts that have been inflated, overblown, and have not delivered value for money, 
to the public, in respect of the All African Games, everything should be investigated, brought to light, and if there's been mis, uh, if there's anything to do with people being uh, uh, miscreants in this matter, they should be prosecuted. They should be prosecuted because it's a lot of money, and the stories that are coming out are terrible. Indeed, and you know, you know, is, just just is, just so that we're talking about what should be investigated. You know, even accreditation tags. Yeah. Accreditation tax for the games cost us four point five million dollars. Just for the printing of an accreditation. From you know, the minister was compelled to give us some kind of information, and now people are bringing so, documents. So, so you have seen it. So yes, we have course. we have documents. Oh, no, we no, have no, documents no, to no, show four point no, five million was let, used. Let everybody be forthright. Yes. The so, people holding the information should just step out. The ministry and should. The, information, the ministry should. It's as simple as that. They should publish people the, the information. If there is no doubt about what went on, yeah, people, people should step right out and give the information out. There is nothing proprietary about no. information to do mm -hmm. with the. Uh, conduct of the All Africa Games. It's not security. No. It's not a security event. It's, it's not about the security of Ghana. It's not about the purchase of arms. It's not about the defense of Ghana. It's about providing entertainment for all the people of Ghana. Now, behind that entertainment process was commitment of public funds. The public deserved to know how those funds were committed, yeah. why the funds were committed, and the purposes to which the funds were committed. And the public have a right to assess for themselves whether the, 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 the Makes sense monies uh, were committed properly. The public have a right to that. In the end, if there is nothing untoward in there, the ministry is absolved, the government is absolved. But why should you allow speculation to go on? Why should you allow uh, uh, the institutions to drag the information out of you? Now here is the Honorable Sam George uh, telling you that the more information, the later in bits you are giving, the more he's dragging you out. Mm -hmm. When that happens, credibility goes down the drain across all fronts. So it is in the interest of those who are holding the information, if they want to remain credible in the public space, to release the information ahead of time. Now that questions are being raised. And to tell us the reasons behind they made behind the, the, the decisions they made, why they made those commitments. And in particular, I want to know who decided to commit $16 million to build a games village which already existed. Right. And, and also, uh, the, the $15 million has been reported as money spent for feeding the athletes, $4.5 million for accreditation. And, so and 16 million and, for and 16 million for for accommodation and this um no, what 3.6 million dollars we're talking about so that's just in fact all the amounts mentioned this 3.6 million dollars actually the least so you're right it's the list of of all the the amounts mentioned in here and so what's going to be the next step for the public accounts committee with all of these amounts so quick one. i i me, me, i am me, afraid me. it's gone beyond the public accounts committee mm -hmm. now so, it is a matter of public interest that the government, through its agencies who handled the okay. event directly, come out boldly before the people of Ghana and tell us, account for what they've done. Because they've taken the plaudits. They've happily accepted Africa telling them that they are the best yeah. uh, destination for sports. I hear they've even uh, 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 applied to do another uh, uh, event in 2030 or something based on this, this success. Oh, well. you, you understand? Uh, so, so you've received all the plaudits. Africa has called on the minister and, and lauded him, and government of Ghana has received all the happiness. Now let's receive the facts behind the happiness. Okay. I don't think that there's any intention to keep the records. Okay. I don't believe so. And I right. think that, I mean, my, my colleague here knows the tools. I mean, as a member of parliament, if we want to inquire into how much was spent, he knows the tools to use. And I'm sure that uh, the ministry will be willing and happy to submit and make those public. I don't think that there, there's anything on towards and that there's anybody interested in keeping any, any information. When the minister was invited to public account committee and was asked specific questions, he, he made full disclosure. Okay. Well, Mr. Sam, so yes, you agree some of the matters goes beyond the public accounts committee. But then again, as, as a member of parliament, very well interested in this matter, what's going to be the next step for you? Well, I mean, I mean we're going to have various angles to this. I'm sure the Youth and Sports Committee of Parliament will want to have uh, a sitting with the minister to interrogate the issues. Public accounts may ask the Auditor General to do a special audit into the All Africa Games. Communications Committee of Parliament is going to be summoning GBC to do our own investigations on the matter. So it's good, but I think that what we need is a proper national conversation around this, the, this, a full audit. I mean, and I think that what we should have is the Auditor General, like we did with COVID, 
when when the COVID funds we kept hearing things that people I mean people bought toilet roll with 200 million Ghana CDs during COVID and all once someone went and paid for an isolation center in Adaku for 25 years for COVID <laughs> I, I, I mean when we heard all of this we we, we used parliament and Parliament directed Auditor General to do a special audit into COVID expenditure. Mm. Public accounts have sat on that report recently. The, the, the findings are mind-boggling. But it, it casts sunshine in the misappropriation of public funds. I think that we need to do the same thing. Parliament has to have a special audit commissioned into the All-Africa Games for us to see what's going on. Who, who are the beneficiaries? Who are the people who benefited from this? And, and let's see if the proper use of Ghanaian taxpayers' money has been uh, carried out by those tax to do so. Uh, thank you very much. And you're also live here on Key Point on, on TV3. We're also live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Gun on Facebook and DSV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Uh, Dr. Kwame Asante says that it is indeed the case, and I agree with all your guests, that this All Africa Games issues must go beyond just the work of the Public Accounts Committee and Parliament. $3.6 million for accreditation. What kind of accreditation was that? $16 million for accommodation in buildings or hostels that already existed. What kind of modification went into that? And $15 million to feed people. Alfred, I want to find out who said that. Well, um, Dr. Kwame Sante, I can tell you, it, this statement is attributed to the ranking member on the Youth Sports and Culture Committee of Parliament, Kobina uh, Woyome. So he made this statement about the $50 million that was used to feed the athletes during the period of the Africa Games. That also raises another matter to look into as well. So many of your messages. After this quick break, when we are back, we're getting to the NPP manifesto emergency arising. In fact, it's just the first part of a long conversation about manifestos we're going to have over the next one month. By next week, the NDC will also have their manifesto. We'll add that to the Movement for Change uh, GTP as well. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Alfred Pi is also joining us on Zoom. He's a data analyst and a public policy analyst going to be joining us to have a conversation. Martin Pebu is still with us on Zoom. Stay with us. I do acknowledge the messages a number of you have sent as well and, and also a number of you also welcoming Dr. Amar Foyen on behalf of the MPP, uh, you see, back on the platform. But then again, I think I mentioned, Dr. Dr. Amar is a relatively, he's new on the platform, it's the first time. So, yes, and uh, this one here. Baptism of fire, like <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and then this one here, oh, uh, acknowledge the 1,943 of your messages. Hey. I want to say thank you very much for expressing your thoughts on all the issues we're talking about this morning. Uh, Aziz, don't laugh from Wa, sends us a message, says, Peace Council has no teeth to bite. Uh, therefore, sh you see, it should be done away with for our democracy, from our democratic dispensation. The victims are crying in grief and agony, you say. Um, this one here says, Maxwell from Talency, it is always unfortunate to watch people who have enjoyed uh, the largesse of power uh, today chasing or chastising the same hands that once fed them. Tell Yabuabing, that there are people in the MPP that haven't benefited anything from government, but still have hopes and confidence in the MPP, and we shall win this election. That's in the words of Maxwell from Talency. Thank you. This one from Papa BCU says that, um, it says eight years, so, sorry, it says eight innocent souls murdered in this election in 2020, and no prosecutions as yet, we must continue to ask the questions of accountability. Musa Abatwa says, Honorable Sam George, your passionate response and appeal uh, says to the Peace Council is exactly what the Ghanaian people needed to hear. Um, you say, um, this one here as well says, uh, okay, this message got truncated at some point, but that leads us to our next conversation about the manifestos. Manifestos. And this first, the NPP launched their manifesto last weekend. In fact, it was the GTP that was launched first. It's about two months ago, right? Barely six weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. 
the, two months ago. In fact, we've been talking GTP since 2023. Indeed. Yes. So it's a fair point to say that the Movement for Change took the lead in outdooring your ideas for the nation going forward. Then the MPP followed with the manifesto, says ushering in the golden age of governance and development. These were the words of Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. Take a look. Clarity of mind as to what I want to do from day one as president. I will not ask you for a honeymoon to cool off and think about what to do with the responsibility you give me. I am prepared and ready to serve. You know what I stand for. You know my vision. I believe in the ingenuity of the Ghanaian. Together we can succeed in building a progressive society of possibilities, enterprise, compassion, open opportunities, and shared prosperity for every Ghanaian, born rich or poor, born in the North or the South, born Christian or Muslim, born a girl or a, leper, a boy, a leper or a disabled person. Open opportunities, shared prosperity, golden age of governance. But I'm a, so I, I, this was not part of the, 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 like the details of the manifesto, but I, I saw it as a pitch by Dr. Bamiya to the Ghanaian people as well. From, you, you sat in there and, and, and you, was, do you think that this statement indeed got a connection to the people who some have indicated, and we are living in it, we, we, we hear the sentiments of the Ghanaian people about this administration. Did this speech do it for you in terms of connecting with the concerns of people? Yes, it did. It did? Absolutely. When I listened to His Excellency, the, the Vice President and our flag bearer, I was so excited. The vision and the aspirations that he espoused, mm. given the track record of the government from 2017 up to now. We've done a very well unprecedented in every sector of the economy, from education, health, and social infrastructure, everywhere. Um, the records of the MPP government um, stands tall than um, our, our main competitors. Um, I, was, I was particularly excited by his deep commitment and, and strong sense of uh, interest in creating jobs for our team and youth. Mm -hmm. Remember that over the last uh, eight years, we have expanded access to secondary education, which has cascading effect on the number of young people who are getting access to tertiary education. Mm -hmm. And what it means is that We've got so many graduates who will be who are produced and are looking for jobs. The labor market, the rate at which the labor market is able to absorb these graduates, and the rate at which the number of graduates are, are produced each year are very inconsistent. More young people are being uh, are graduating than what the labor market can absorb. So that creates um, a, a job issues, unemployment issues. Uh, beyond that. Um, there are long, many young, young people who are not in employment, who are not in education, who are not in training, what we call the needs category. Mm -hmm. And they, there has to be uh, a mechanism, a policy intervention that will ensure that they are gainfully employed. And if you listen to what he said, it was very clear on Skills Ghana, developing the skills of our young people, harnessing the talent of our young people, and also fostering what he, he described as the growth, growth mindset. The growth mindset, the, the imperative of the growth mindset is for people to harness um, not only their innate talent, but to collaborate with others to achieve shared results. And so I think that um, the, the, if you go through the manifesto, the key selling points uh, job creation, job creation, and job creation. Mm. Job creation in various sectors, in agriculture, in health, in education, 
um, in IT, in every sector of the economy, uh, the job creation opportunities there. And it seeks to strengthen technical vocation, education, and training mm. by um, improving the facilities in, in, this, in, this sec in this sector and ensuring that we got more of our young people developing the skills and aptitude to be able to create, create, create jobs. If you put that aside, he was very clear in his, his, his commitment towards ensuring that everybody is brought into the, 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 the net. You know, and what it means is that you take account of everybody, um, regardless of their, uh, their agenda, social status, and then also their abilities. So he talks, he makes very specific reference to peoples with dis people with disability. We have increased the share of the Assembly's Common Fund um, for people with disability by, by 50%. He's promised to ensure that uh, people with disability get, get access to tertiary education by offering scholarship uh, uh, for, for, for them as well. And then he makes mention of our education system, how he wants to revolutionize our education system and, and improve on what we have done so far. But what is also very key is, whilst he talks about the expenditure as, as side, he also makes mention of the revenue side to ensure that we get the needed resources to be able to uh, implement his policy uh, intentions. Mm. particularly reference to the, our tax system. Right. Um, I, I, for anybody who has some uh, basic understanding of tax regimes, there are three key main tax regimes. Either is the progressive tax regime, which really works on um, the higher paying, higher, higher, higher income earners paying more. Mm. Uh, you have the proportional tax regime, which everybody pays a proportion of their salary. And then you have the regressive uh, okay, tax, tax regime. Uh, the, the, sorry, the regressive tax regime. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been implementing the last, all these years, the, the progressive type, type of tax, tax regime. He has indicated that we're going to have a, a flat rate tax system, which is more of the proportional tax, uh, well, tax regime, which, you know, um, economists, um, and, and the famous one you can think of, Adam Smith makes very clear that it's one of the most fair and, and, and uh, uh, equitable tax system that one can think of. But it's I'm much easier rate. for anybody. Uh, yes, of course, we we'll, 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 we'll look at the, the numbers um, once, um, yeah, once you, you launched the, the manifesto. So I was hoping yes. that maybe you put in the, the, the flat rate you are proposing. At what rate exactly? I haven't seen it in the manifesto. Yes, of course. I mean, the different indicators. You know that you're going to, you have different sectors of the economy, income and S or income tax. You have corporate tax. So we look at all of them and then, and then have a determinable functional rate that will work for everybody. But what is very clear is the idea that you need to be able to have a tax system that is very, very transparent. Remember that one of the key features of a good tax system is it transparency and convenience, uh, it's convenience. And once you, it's very transparent and convenient, it's easy to also to enforce compliance. And, and, and in doing so, you are able to generate uh, more resources. He talks about governance and improving our governance architecture, and especially deepening local governance uh, at the district level. They want to ensure that every assembly members who are also elected representative of our people are, are, are afforded a share of the uh, assembly's uh, common fund. So if you go through the manifesto, and in fact, this is the manifesto, 260 page, a government in mm. power um, seeking to, 260 page, a uh, government in power seeking a third term, having, <coughs> having to go through a very strenuous, laborious process to create and evolve a policy document of this of this nature shows that we are very much committed. We are very much deep in understanding the issues that confront our people, and that we are very much ready and prepared to take Ghana to to the next level, having laid a very solid foundation in President Akufuado's See, now also make the point about you not admitting the current state of affairs in this country, in this, in this manifesto presentation, the realities that we are faced with as to the, the, the increasing cost of living, the hardship that we are faced with, there was no clear, honest I, I, I'm admission. I'm not sure that you have, you have had the, access to the manifesto. If you read page one to five, 
the, the manifesto talks about our current situation, the challenges that we have, and then the progress that we've made. I mean, there's no the, way the that you can make... That yes, 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 of you, course. Of course, listen, there's no way that you can make projections without taking account where you stand from or where you have come from. Uh, there's this simple saying that a child who doesn't know where he is, wh where he comes from, doesn't know where he is and where he's going. So in few, if you go through the manifesto, you will get um, at every, especially at the sectoral level, and then also at the preface, prefatory uh, sections, you mm -hmm. will see um, provisions of, you know, admissions of the challenges we find ourselves in. We are in a very precarious uh, circumstances that are have been imposed by external uh, circumstances. It, so we have admitted that we have, but yeah, we, have, but we have admitted that we've got, we have, we find ourselves in a very difficult circumstance, but we've made progress. In the last, in the last, I think, um, uh, 12 months or so, we've been able to bring inflation down. We've been able to move the, the, the growth rate, uh, increase the growth rate, and even revise the initial projections that we, 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 we anticipated. So if you look at all the economic indicators, clearly it's showing that we're moving into in, 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 in the right direction, given, even though we find ourselves in, in certain circumstances. Okay. We, 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 we cannot make any policy proposals without taking account of the existing circumstances. And His Excellency has been very clear that he knows that Ghanaians are going through a lot of uh, difficulties and challenges at this moment, not only in Ghana, across the world. And it's important that we place ourselves within the Committee of Nations and see what is happening elsewhere. Well, okay, but it just cannot be about just about Russia-Ukraine war. I think that's, and, and COVID, that's where the, the sense of dishonesty, some people have pointed, comes, comes, comes in. But then again, and but this you cannot bring in, you cannot discount that yes, as a indeed. very significant but it's not just about the only reason why. But you can't discount that. True. I mean, even in, in difficult, even in strong economies like like Britain, they have equally made such ad admissions. And across okay. across the world, many economies are struggling under the ravages of 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 of, of the pandemic and then also the Russia-Ukraine war. You can't dis discount that at all. There okay. may be internal challenges that, uh, that, 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 that might, might you know, influence the, the difficulties we find ourselves, but you cannot discount entirely the uh, significant impact that these external shocks have had on our economy. Uh, Mr. George, you also have to come in briefly because he has to leave, but I asked specific questions about the, the flat tax rate because we needed to know, when we get to know the percentage, it even help us in the conversation because you abolished some 15 new taxes when you came in into power in 2017, describing them as nuisance taxes. From then on, there's been about 22 new taxes that you have introduced as well for the period. So if you are now speaking another language about taxes, I just needed to know the specifics, which I don't find. But you say eventually you will give us the details and we can have a conversation on that. But Ms. George, you are launching your manifesto today. Yes. What superior alternative are you offering to the Ghanaian people? Well, in terms of policies and ideas. Well, I, I will not sit here and intend to take the wind out of the sail of His Excellency President Mahama, who will lead and speak to our manifesto. But it's a manifesto that's very youth centric. In fact, for the first time, we've launched a youth version of our manifesto already. Um, I think sometime last week, last week, Monday, we, we launched the youth manifesto which focused and teased out the portions of our manifesto that deal with the young people of our country because that's an area that's of utmost importance to President Mahama. Um, the young people of our country have been hoodwinked, they've been gaslighted by Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and uh, President Akufuado, and we would not have the young people of our country gaslighted and hoodwinked again. And so we, 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 the, the bar has been raised. But, I mean, like I said, as we speak right now, if you are anywhere near the University of Education, Winneby, you'd realize that we've set up um, thematic area booth, booths mm -hmm. where we're running through the highlights of the manifesto, even ahead of um, the, the event. Um, I chair the Digital Economy, ICT and Innovations Committee, and mm. my team is already on the ground there. And there are various other sectors 
thematic area sectors that are, are running. But like I said, I, I wouldn't want to speak to specifics. But there are parts, there are parts of our manifesto that have already been put out. And even with the parts that have been put out, you can see that the NPP, what the NPP launched last weekend is heavily plagiarized. It's plagiarized. Heavily from, plagiarized. I mean, from it's, your ideas. And, and I'm just going to run through a few of them okay. with evidence so that it's not as though it's political talk. Yes, I on need page that because... on page nineteen and twenty two of their, you know, you have the key, the highlights, the, the highlights. Page nineteen and twenty two of that manifesto, they say they are going to train a hundred, a million youth in digital skills. Now, as far back as second of October, twenty twenty, I'm giving you dates. Mm -hmm. This was even before the formation of Movement for Change, so they can't even claim that is their policy. <laughs> Because in 2020, there was no movement for change. Mm -hmm. On the 2nd of October 2020, <laughs> uh, I'm taking care of that because I'll leave after my submission. <laughs> no, that's, that's right. uh, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm taking no, care of both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> as far back as 2nd of October 2020, there's a major online story that published President Mahama saying we will train 1 million youth in coding, and it was in our 2020 People's Manifesto. Again, when you take page 13 of our Youth Manifesto that was launched, it's there, One Million Coders program. Again, on page 27 of the MPP's manifesto, they say they are introducing a free tertiary education scholarship for persons with disabilities to remove financial barriers. Now, if you take President Mahama's statement captured by Ghana Web on 27th October 2020, President Mahama promised, and again in our People's Manifesto, President Mahama promised free tertiary education for persons with disabilities. In fact, the NDC has gone beyond that now to do our No Fee Stress initiative on page 7 of the Youth Manifesto, which goes even beyond persons with disabilities all the way to even every first year student having their academic fees paid, the academic user fee, the academic fees paid for them to drop that entry barrier that we see. On page 21 of the MPP's manifesto, they say they are going to abolish the betting tax. It's strange. Mm -hmm. I mean that Dr. Baumia, who introduced the tax, is promising to remove the tax and is expecting some credit for it. Before Dr. Baumia, we didn't know a betting tax. But again, if you go to President Mahama's speech, on the 2nd of May, 2023, Ghana at Crossroads at Kempinski, he spoke explicitly there, and again, it's captured by City Newsroom and TV3 uh, uh, three Newsroom as well, that we would abolish the, e, the betting tax. We stated there on the, on the 2nd of May, 2023. On page 23 of the MPP's manifesto, they promised to abolish the E-Levy. The E-Levy that they had Dr. Amma and Co. come in and defend and said that it was the best thing to happen to Ghana since Coca-Cola and Ben's bread. It will fix all our problems. E-Levy has not fixed the problems. Now Dr. Baumia on page 23 of your manifesto says they will abolish E-Levy. Well, again, at Ghana, the crossroads, May 2nd, 2023, we promised President Mahama had already made that commitment to abolish the E-Levy. On page 26, they said they are going to establish a Women's Trade Empowerment Fund. Again, on the 9th of July, 2024, President Mahama announced that the NDC was not going to establish a fund, but we would establish a Women's Development Bank. So again, another stolen promise. On page 20 and 22 of your manifesto, you promised to set up a fintech fund with seed capital of 100 million. Again, you just heard that we had promised that, and so you ran on that. Because and on the 15th of March 2024, at Pediasi, where we had an engagement with CSOs on the work that we were doing, and again, because that's my sector, the ICT sector, President Mahama announced our 50 million US dollar fintech industry fund to strengthen that industry. On page 28, they say, oh, we'll cap our ministers at 50. This is coming from Dr. Baumia. Who's, who at a point in time was vice president of a government that had 122 ministers and today has over 80 ministers. Now he says they'll cap at 50 because they had heard that President Mahama had stated that he would reduce the number of ministers and deputies drastically as far back as 3rd of March 2023. And I'm giving you dates. On page 28, they said that they're going to engage parliament and other stakeholders to review the 1992 constitution to achieve effective national development. This is the government that for eight years has failed to do anything on a constitutional review commission report. That was there before they came in. But as far back as August 29, 2022, President Mahama said we would amend the 1992 constitution or portions of the 1992 constitution and carry out constitutional review, and even was specific to say that we will cancel ex gratia as far back as August 29, 2022. On page 21 of your manifesto, you say you will implement a flat rate for all importers, bringing predictability and stability on prices of imported goods. As far back as April 10, 2024, President Mahama 
during his tour of the Greater Accra, meeting uh, importers at the Shippers Council and at Abusi Okai, stated clearly what our policy on import duties were, the harmonization of import duties mm -hmm. to ensure that these prices are dropped. Again, on page 24, they said that they are going to stabilize the prices of spare parts through a flat rate for all importers. On the 17th of March 2024, President Mahama, meeting the Abusi Okai spare part dealers, had said this. And for the Abusi Okai spare part dealers, this was their response. They said, Mahama's spare part import proposal, a game changer. So this is, this is Abusi Okai reacting to us as far back as the 17th of March this year. On page 18, they said they are going to increase public-private partnerships as an important funding model for develop, delivering public infrastructure projects. On the 10th of June 2024, President Mahama spoke to the country and said that his administration will harness PPPs, BOT deals, to boost infrastructure development. Again, if you go to page 29 of their manifesto, and this is the last but one before I, I wrap up. On page 29 of their manifesto, they talk about protecting biodiversity and forest hotspots. This is coming from the government that, is giving, that has issued an executive instrument that has allowed for mining in forest reserves and has just decided to sell off the last green belt that we have in Accra, the Achimota Park. They're, they're giving it off to sell to themselves. Are you talking and about now, the LI2426? Yes, that one. And, and that same party is now saying that they are going to do this. <laughs> Meanwhile, as far back as 15th of May 2024, President Mahama outlined what we call our blue water policy, our small scale mining policy, and our tree for life policy. And it's even captured on page 13 of our youth manifesto, where we're going to aggressively green and reclaim lands that have been destroyed by, by, by the MPP and his appointees. Because when we see party here, Sika, you remember that, 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 that audio from Frimpon Boating's office, Professor Frimpon Boating's office. And the last one, page 27, they said they're going to increase the stock of student accommodation in our public universities. Oh my God. Go and read page seven of the NDC's Youth Manifesto. We have an aggressive bed for all program that will work with the private sector to build accommodation facilities on tertiary campuses. So you clearly see that the government of the NPP's manifesto is plagiarism, there's nothing original, and when you take someone's idea and because you don't understand it, that you, it, are, you, can't you are seeking it. to do the mm -hmm. same things but through different channels. And so if you say it's plagiarism, it means mm -hmm. they are actually lifting and, oh, and, and saying exactly what you're going to do. So I, you are talking about one million trading... One, yes, uh, one million codes. One million. We've been saying this and since 2020. The, the MPP said they are doing one million training for IT, IT training for young people. What, is, is it the same? Absolutely. How? We, we, we announced a one million codes co program. Coding, and we stated, coding, but, you see, but coding is just one part of <laughs> IT. No. No, you see, you see. No, so, no, no, so, no. No. so they, they said they said they're going to do digital skills. Yes. Now, what digital skills they haven't specified? They haven't yes. told you. You have specified that is coding. We, we've specified coding. We've actually specified how we're going to achieve the, the one million. We've actually specified how we're going to roll it out. And the, and you see, the beauty of it is because we have thought it through and we have a blueprint for our policy. If you, again, I don't want to go into the details of the manifesto, but <laughs> the coding the coding is linked to a number of other things. One of the things the coding is linked to, is, okay. which I can speak about because President Mahama has already announced that, is the Digital Jobs Initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, you, 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 you don't just train a million people in coding. You train a million people in coding, what are they going to do? You can't have a million ICT entrepreneurs. Absolutely. You must have a place to offtake them. And that's why we have the Digital Jobs Initiative that's going to employ 300,000 young Ghanaians. So it's- In, the, the, in which areas? Employing 300,000 in, in digital where? jobs. It's called Digital Jobs Initiative. The breakdown and all will come. But it's, it's, it's in partnership with the private sector. We have okay. the blueprint for it. Now, so that's already 300,000 out of your 1 million that you're taking out. Apart from that, we've announced our ICT parks, our digital innovation parks. We, we did the first pilot, the Accra Digital Center. We have a track record. In eight years, they've not built any digital center. With all the digitalization talk that they have, they make, they've not built a single digital hub or digital... Uh, uh, digital center. That's, we that's we build true. a crowd digital center. That's not true. Uh, no, no so please. Got, which digital we've center got have you built? About forty-five digital hub, ICT hubs. We're not talking about. We're not talking about ICT labs just, that you that's built. What you said. No, you I said, said digital have, centers. No, not hub. hub. No, no, no. A hub is different. A hub. A hub is. A hub is basically an ICT room with 30, 40 computers sitting there. So it's a starting point for you. So that's what. Okay, fine. I mean, I mean, I mean, you guys think small. We think big. It's fine. You want digital hubs? We're talking about digital centers, transformative, transformative digital centers. Not done anything. You don't have a digital center. I'm not talking digital hubs. I'm talking digital centers. When you go to the Accra Digital Center, there are multiple hubs. 
hubs there. Right. We have a document processing hub there. We have a business processing outsourcing hub there. So in that big digital center, you've got multiple hubs. Okay. Do you get it? So I'm not talking about hubs. It's just like the way when we are talking about building hospitals. They talk about building wards in hospitals. I mean, look, the MPP think small. They think within within the confines of the of the small box. We are big thinkers. We are transformational thinkers. Because when, when it comes to infrastructure, you've heard about our big push, ten billion dollars over over ten over five years. So for me, talk. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm just going to state clearly. We've seen your manifesto. It's a is a is a is a, a, a bunch of huff and fluff. There really is no substance to it. In fact, the GTP has more substance. The GTP is less than 10 pages, if I'm not mistaken. It's, no, no. it's, it's, it's a 10 bullet point, I think, ten or, or point, so. I think but even about... in that, you see more substance than 296 pages of just flowery language that's plagiarized and AI generated. But you see, the real stuff is going to come out today. And when President Muhammad finishes <laughs> delivering it, you will realize that we have a blueprint, we have a future, we have a vision, and the young people of our country and the agri, uh, and, and agri processing is going to be at the heart of the next Muhammad government over the next four years. We interrogated your, yes, your, your youth manifesto last week. We will wait for the details as you talk about. Sure. Because we'll have to know specific areas, for instance, that you expect the private sector to move in. Private sector, as we speak in its current form and nature, is struggling because of all what they've had to go because through. Because of the mess of the NPP's government. Yeah. So if you're expecting <clears throat> private sector to do so much, in the next four no, years, we'll enable them. I want to There's know a lot of the specific enabling, yeah, yeah. enabling oh, no, measures you know, that Alfred, you want to put Alfred, in place. Let me just give a typical example. Do you know what 16, 16 million dollars that has been thrown down the drain in air conditions? Do you know what that could have done in ICE, increasing ICT jobs in a BPO? Okay. You know I mean? In I'm fact, the Accra Digital Center, we built it with $10 million. The whole Accra Digital Center, we built it with $10 million. So $16 million would have almost built two. By the time you add what they spent on accreditation and that, would have built two ICT centers, digital centers, one in, in, in the Middle Belt and one in the Northern region. But they use it, and they, well, they blow it away. Uh, don't go away. <laughs> Cancel. Look, GTP, you have your own outline measures. But you've seen what the MPP are presented. At least you, there are some highlights that the NDC sure we'll yes, back, eh? yes, yeah, highlights that the NDC has presented. We have an idea of what they intend to put out today because the flag bearer has been speaking, and then also the youth manifesto that they put out there. What is your superior view? You you are a very perceptive moderator. You ask the question that flaws both of them. You <laughs> started talking private sector. And you said the private sector is struggling. And you want to know the specific ways in which they will build the private sector. He was not able to answer. He went back to the scandals of the Africa Games. But listen to this. Just a paragraph. So I've been engaged. Is it a I've been compliment or otherwise? I've been engaged. <laughs> your, you. Yes. Oh, you. I'm paying you a compliment. Ah, okay. You ask fantastic questions. No, no, I'm only because you. They, they, the no, question no, no. you asked is very deep. If they've started using the language of private sector, private sector, you ask them just, how they're going to empower the I, private I sector. You're afraid of owning to... that quality? No, no, okay, no. I've owned it. No, it's fine. I've <laughs> owned it. I'm questioning how, because it's in the GTP, how we are going to build the private sector. Okay. But let me read this. This is from a 30-year, 8-year-old voter, a Ghanaian, who I met barely a few weeks ago, who asked me for a favor because he thought I was a high-profile, politically exposed person with capacity to get him something in government. I told him that unfortunately I am unable to do so because I hardly ever ask those kinds of favors from government. I don't go chasing contracts and otherwise. Now listen to this, just a paragraph. Good morning, bro. He's 38 years old. Mm -hmm. A young person in this country. MPP and DC have been running this country for 32 years. Good morning, bro. Okay, Which I, as part I of do understand. Years. Yes, I do understand. It is just that the system here in Ghana doesn't really work. Because if it does, how will a degree and a master's holder be struggling to get basic needs in life? And this is where I went sad. Mm. I think in my next birth, if Ghana is going to be born, I would rather die than to come back to a place like Ghana. Nothing works here. Since I received this text last night, I have been entirely and totally disturbed. A 38-year-old 
person in Ghanaian trained and he has so many other he sent me so many other certificates of short courses uh, uh, project management courses uh, and all that that he's had and at 38 he's already saying that he wished he would die because he's lost faith in Ghana we are looking at 32 years where we haven't been able to bring a big idea mm. to our economics it's been manifesto after manifesto but what is the big idea what is the transforming idea that which will change the structure of this economy and establish continuing expanding spaces for sustainable jobs and increased revenue for government what are we doing we are building the washington the two manifestos are washington consensus budgets mm. <laughs> putting a liberal uh, open market on on uh, 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 outdated old-fashioned primary commodity exporting structures mm. we've liberalized according to the imf world bank but we are unable to change the basic structure of the economy to support the liberalization so what you have is that these liberal market policies are struggling to engage the rigid primary export commodity thing that we have. And these manifestos are what they are looking at. The impact is you are getting very little in terms of revenue. And yet you have to provide a lot. And they are struggling about who stole whose idea to provide. To provide what? The things they are talking about providing, they are borrowing money to attempt to provide. So we are in a borrow and spend situation. 17 times we've gone to the IMF. The, uh, and they are speaking as if they've not been in government. And he's saying, yes, I was in government with the, uh, 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 what do you call it, the MPP. So 32 years, 16 years, 16 years. We've gone to the IMF 17 times. The last time NDC was in power, <laughs> they left behind a Ghana in the clutches of the IMF. Now MPP are going out of power. We are in the clutches of the IMF. Why? All these promises they've made in the voluminous uh, uh, manifestos, 200 and something pages, is based on borrow and spend. Borrow to pay for infrastructure and to provide social capital uh, uh, expenses. And these things have long gestation periods. Because you are building the roads with borrowed money. You are building schools with borrowed money. Mm. You are providing a free education for uh, PWDs with borrowed money. Uh, you are building ICT halls with borrowed money. You are training one million people with borrowed money. And none of that money that you are borrowing is returning. The things you are using the money to do, it's not returning you an immediate income to pay back the borrowing. So now we've gone to the stage where we are borrowing to pay what we are borrowing. Yeah, yeah. eh? mm -hmm. Alfred, that's where we are now. Yeah. We are borrowing to pay what we have borrowed. And, and you are running a headline this morning that says that the finance ministry is going to go to its last round of uh, haircuts on, or that, on dollar bonds. Debt exchange. It's a haircut. Debt exchange is a haircut. That, that is what they do. They said they wouldn't have any haircuts. The following day we had haircuts. Now we all know that debt exchange means haircut. So if you are giving us haircuts now and you are standing in uh, 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 somewhere launching a manifesto and saying you are going to build airports. Something you promised before you couldn't do. <laughs> Why should that be credible? Why should it even be a choice of manifesto? Um, because you don't have the money. Right. You are going to borrow money to build an airport when you are borrowing money to pay your debts. Those manifestos are not credible. We are in a debt trap. Now, look at the economy and the private sector. Now we go back to that. How is the economy being managed on the monetary side? Inflation targeting. The, I don't know whether the NDC will say anything about it, but the MPP talks about its achievements. We build this, like I said, all those achievements have been built on borrowing to invest. Yes. Now, in all of that, they've started talking private sector. But look at how they are managing capital, which is the basic way of bringing private sector on board, including everybody in the, in the economy. Inflation targeting. They are increasing interest rates at every opportunity in order to contain inflation. 
a, 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 a Bretton Woods Washington consensus tactic. But the problem we have here is that any time you increase these interest rates, you are crowding out the private sector. Because the private sector cannot afford to borrow at 33% and be competitive enough to deliver the service you want them to deliver. They can't. If you are borrowing at 33%, how can, what work will you do to pay the interest of 33% and pay your principal and make money to expand your enterprise? You don't even keep afloat. You die. Mm. Now, it means you don't even go into manufacturing. You import whatever. When you import, your capital also depreciates because every time you import, the currency goes down. So by the time you finish selling, the amount you have is not able to afford the same amount of yeah, no, no, yes, the money. same amount of uh, 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 what do you call it you had earlier, the same amount of capital you had earlier. Okay. So even the structure yes. of our monetary sector run by the government through the Bank of Ghana, is inhibiting the ability of Ghanaians to build capital to grow this country. It's a disaster. So none of these manifestos is dealing with that. Now let's go to public procurement, where we are bleeding the most. Mm. What are those manifestos saying? What are they saying about corruption? How are they going to manage corruption? Public procurement. When now, as we speak, uh, uh, we are unable we are unable to come to grips with it. There are two, three things that are very clear that the GTP talks about. The first one is that we must deal decisively with public procurement, right. particularly the sole sourcing. So the GTP is saying we will abolish sole sourcing. The kinds of scandals associated with procurements for the uh, uh, All-Africa Games and many other procurements that have occurred, uh, mm -hmm. which keep unraveling yes. after the effort. We'll, get, we'll deal entirely with that. Then we are going to recalibrate the law on corruption. Yes. And I'm going to have you move a bit. And okay. while you, that, on that particular last point on corruption, because mm. Dr. Tama spoke initially about jobs, one of the major anchors of this manifesto that the MP presented is jobs, jobs creation. Yeah. This is why I bring in, uh, and you but conclude on the point. Yeah, yes, you will. Alfred Apia is a data scientist and policy, public policy I, I analyst. Yeah, on, on the corrupt, corruption. Uh, uh, just the corruption. Yes. I hope you let me conclude on this uh, analysis. Mr. Apia, I, yes. I'm hoping that will. I will respond, will respond to uh, Can you hear me? Comments. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on Keypoint. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, thank you for the patience in correcting the sound with you. Um, First off, why uh, Dr. Baumia made the claim about some 2.3 million jobs that had been created by this administration between 2017 and well, since they came into office. The last time the vice president mentioned this was sometime in 2022, I think. And that 2.3 million jobs is still being maintained. But why do you contest that figure exactly? So I will start by saying that you know, even when you, and hopefully my slides are showing, yes. um, I, I said it to your producers, but um, even in the government or the politicians, I want to, I, because I'm using other government sources, so I just want to make sure that this is coming from the politicians. Um, even when you look at the government's own performance tracker, right, the numbers on there are different from what the vice president has been saying. Uh, uh, when you look at the government's performance tracker, it says there's about 2.08 or maybe 2.1 million jobs that have been created. And it's, that is key because um, I also wanted to point to the definition of jobs here. On the, This is again, this is from the government's performance tracker. It says that these are employment that are sustainable and meets the tenets of decent work, especially in terms of ensuring they have pensions and the uh, right type of work in line with the mandate of the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations. And so, and this is a key thing because the data uh, or the job numbers that the vice president has been talking about is basically formal, sustainable jobs. Um, and so when you look at that, it says 2.3 million since 2017, right? Uh, I mean, the, the tracker says 2.1. Let's go with the 2.3 because that's what that has, that's what has been bundled around. That's what we're trying to challenge. When you look at that and then you look at, this is sustainable jobs, pensions and all of that. When you look at the, between 2016 and 2017, the uh, between 2016 and 2023, uh, the the number of active net contributors it has only increased by about just under 700,000. 
right? Here's a case, a vice president is saying there's 2.3 million jobs. These jobs are sustainable. They're supposed to be having pension and all of that. So that, that is one data point that doesn't actually support that. I just wanted to say that. And then the other thing on the tracker that you see also is that they do provide a breakdown of the public and private sector jobs. And on the tracker, it says that there's 1.8 million public sector jobs. And then uh, employment in the private sector based on SNIT data is 267,000 jobs. Com when you compare that to what the vice president would say, he said the public sector actually has created 1.4 million jobs and the private sector has created about 975,000 jobs. So even among the politicians in, in the same party, the, the data is inconsistent. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't match up. And then part of my other exercise that I've been doing is because at the end of the day, we only got a spreadsheet, a snippet of a spreadsheet, I should say, from the vice president. So what other sources do we have available that has data on the labor market that we can use to then say that really we have, we have created this, 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 this amount of jobs? And so some of the sources that I looked at was, one, the Ghana Stats Service. So the Ghana Statistical Service, um, in 2015, we did the labor force survey. It's a nationally representative um, survey. And then in 2022 and 2023, they've been doing this annual household income and employment survey. So both, both are nationally representative surveys. So we should be, we should be um, reasonable in comparing them. When you look at those over those two time periods, and even that is even a longer time period, when you do look at that, the job, total job created um, over that time frame is just about 1.6 million. And this is all jobs, right? Remember, the Ghanaian economy is largely informal, and a lot of the jobs are, you know, people that are self-employed without any employees. And so, when you look at that time frame, the total job growth is about 1.6 million. Here's a case we are being told that there's 2.3 million jobs in public and formal private sector. So that in itself doesn't doesn't explain that. Um, then you also look at the structure of the labor market. Um, you know, in terms of, I, I did mention self-employed without employees. There's also like people that are in wage employment. When you look at, compare the, the labor market structure between 2017, uh, 2016, 2017, and 2023, you see that actually the number of people that are in paid employment has actually declined. Uh, the percentage of people that are in, in, in labor market, I should say, have declined. So if you've created all these 2.3 million jobs, you should really see some foundational shifts in the structure of the labor market. And that data is not showing us that. I point to another data from the Ghana Start Service, which is um, breaking down the jobs uh, of the people, that the, the number of employed people by sectors. So you see they have public, they have private formal, they have semi-public and all of that. When you look at the public, as of, as of end of 2022, and I'm using that because again, the vice president's data that he shared was actually as of 2022. When you look at that, on average, the public service has about 700,000 employees, and then the private sector has about 900,000, 930,000 um, people that are working in there. So we take the public data and compare it to the 1.4 1 million that the mm -hmm. vice president says it, it has been created over the period. That doesn't add up, right? And, and that, that, that's, a fun, that's a fundamental point because we cannot even account for the 1.4 million then we can act, then we have to also account for the people that are working in the public service before the government took power in 2017. So yeah. these are fundamental points. The same thing, you can do the same analysis for controller and accountant general. And when this argument came up and we mentioned controller and accountant general data, some people had made a point that, well, the controller doesn't pay everybody on, in the public service. And that is true. Um, but when, even when you look at there's also the people that are paid through subvention, like the Ghana police, the Ghana armed forces. So when, even when you put all of it together and even add like national service, the total controller staff strength as of 2022 is about 890,000. That is nowhere close to 1.4 million. And then we look at those that are outside of controller. So you think of the ECG, Cocoa Board, those ones are all captured under the SIGA report, the, 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 the SIGA state ownership report. So you can see that they do have, they do put good staff strength in there. Um, as of 2021, it was about 69,000 69, people um, that were working, 68,000 people that were, that were employed. Even some of this might even include like those right. in the joint venture capital, uh, joint venture companies. So between all these sources, you cannot really confirm the 2.3 right. million. Hmm. So that, and then that, you can also look at tax data too. I mean, sorry, one, one final point on yeah. tax data, because at the end of the day, if people are employed, right, we should see a reflection in the growth in the tax data. When you look at GRA data, you compare between that, uh, say, I, well, one of the exercises I did was 2019 and 2022. 
what has been the growth in the taxpaying population. Compare that and look at how many jobs that have been created according to the vice president over that time period. You cannot reconcile. And yeah. so it's, it is hard to be able to say that these 2.3 million jobs in public and formal private sector has been created. When looking at all these different sources, we cannot use that to substantiate uh, that, 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 that number that has been put out. So, Dr. Ama, this is evident. Uh, I, mean, I mean, he makes reference... Yes, no, you have your last point. He makes specific reference to publicly available data about the jobs that have been created. So where's the vice president? I, or or I, where I, do you... You, you I, get your data from. I would want to have a look at it, um, his report and read later. Okay. But what I can say from the onset, I mean, the, the argument that is made, that I wish to reflect on the number of Senate contributor, uh, contributors, actually amputates the, the point that he's making um, in respect of the job okay. creation. Because... When I was at the university, teaching at the university, I didn't contribute to SNET. If you're going to rely on SNET data alone as a basis to uh, determine the number of jobs created, then that's a problem. So I think that, I think that um, the Well, it's the a foundational point, analysis. Yes, the so point that he's making... It's just if his he, first take on yes, this. So if, next if, week we have a bigger Yes, if he, if he relies solely on, on that. And that's why I said I want to go and, and read, because there are okay. so many public servants <coughs> right. who are not on Senate and uh, on, uh, on the other forms of uh, pension schemes. I don't know if Africa I can... Ref, in ref, 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 I don't know if but I the government is relying on Senate. So the government data relies on Senate. Can I? Right. The yes. government private formal sector jobs is based on Senate data. That's what we've been told. I see. Perfect. Alfred, thank you for that intervention. Yes. Yes, so, so I think on, on, on that score, um, the data that has been shared which is reference to the number of jobs created, there right. has not been any means of falsifying that. What is attempted to do is to extrapolate some data elsewhere and make some just positions that um, they are not plausible. I don't think that from the argument that is made, I don't think that what is making uh, is actually a reflective of what's, uh, what's real. So um, but I don't know if I can respond to such as some of If I can res respond to that, well, yes, um, but we're going to have a bigger conversation. Are you going to worry? Yes. Yes. So, yes, I yes, 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 a, well, yes, a quick well, one. Yes, a quick mm -hmm. one. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is noted as being uh, at the forefront of digitalization, and that he is at some point even accused of running away from the economy. What the promises that we've made in the manifesto? Okay. There's none of them that he can claim that. It came from there. If you say you are going to do one million, um, train one million youth in coding, that is completely distinct from training one million in digital skills. Digital skills is much more broader than coding. Coding is okay. just an aspect. It's just right. programming. It's okay. just an aspect of the digital skills. You have digital marketing, I online reputation marketing, I you have data analy it. analytics, all of these form part of what? digital what? What? So, right. so, so what he was making was actually a reference to a specific part of digital marketing. We have bigger, sorry, no, but I deserve my business. I concluded my YouTube channel. We actually didn't finish. And you are allowing your camera to go on and on and on. We didn't finish. You plagiarized it. The NDC just misquoted the Abosu Okai people as early as 4th March. Mm -hmm. 2024, they had accepted Mr. Chair Martin's policy on spare parts before your mama went to repeat the same thing on 15th March. Okay. And as I'm saying, Cocoa Board has decided to purchase Cocoa locally. Something that Alan Chair Martin said they ought to do and now they have started doing. There are things I needed to do. We have to but establish an enterprise be, economy. That good news that we are Yes, you are, you are plagiarizing. The, the point I'm making is that... We don't own that. <laughs> no. that Thank region. you. For so but many years... You've refused to buy cocoa that. properly. Mr. Chematin say says, if, right. if the GTP, I am going, going to purchase then, cocoa then, locally, then the following day you are doing it without us. explanation. You don't, right. you don't even you. understand how it's going to work. Anyway, so I as I indicated, we are as I indicated, by next week, we would have three, at least three manifestations, which you will also come back to. And that's a promise. And that's what, indeed. So, gentlemen, guess what? Next week, we have a manifesto conversation. The NDC, the MPP, and the Movement for Change manifesto.
manifesto. So you, you call it the great transformational, transformational plan. You have a copy. It is that's a plan. It. Yeah, that's this it. Is it. This is GTP. Yes, that is the GTP. GTP. So we'll have a conversation. It's a blueprint. Blueprint and all of that. For Thank growth. you. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say that next week we'll have a date again with Alfred Apia, lawyer Martin Pebo, Yawabian Samoa, and Dr. Alfred Ama, who is a deputy minister of Dr. Prince Hamidou Ama. He is a deputy minister for works and housing, also in charge of the education committee of the MPP manifesto. So we'll have a full-fledged conversation on the issue, specifically on education as well next week. Uh, if you make some time to join us. Sam George also was with us. We are continuing the conversation on the coverage of the NDC manifesto launch here on your election command center. My colleagues Eric Mayonek, Beta, Komla Kloche are there already. Bella Mundi and Kemeni Amano and also Joseph Akable are going to continue the coverage here on your election command center together with the team and our guests as well. So don't flip your dial, stay with us. My name is Alfred Akansi. Enjoy our programming and our coverage. Good morning. <laughs>